for a swim and a drink. This is Safari Live. Ready. Good afternoon everybody and welcome to our sunset safari on this scorchingly hot day. It feels like all the people in the world have left their oven open. There is a hot wind and it is very warm indeed. And as you can see this Batelier Eagle is making the most of it and coming down to the water hole for a little drink. It is the perfect place if you are an eagle to quench one's thirst. Treehouse Dam, it's nice and shallow and really is quite wonderful for a cooling off place like I said to have a little drink now my name is Tristan and on camera today I've got Sebastian and this is coming to you live from South Africa so hashtag Safari live if you want to ask any questions or on the YouTube chat as well we'll be able to go through as many questions as possible this afternoon and also if you just want to say hello from wherever you're watching but this is a wonderful rare occurrence we don't often see Batelier Eagles down on the ground and in close proximity to us they're generally a little bit flighty and will try and get away from where we are so it's for have one coming right to the edge of the water and drinking is very special so hopefully it's going to drink I think we disturbed it a little bit when we arrived at Treehouse Dam so it's just we're wondering how it's going to sort of approach the water and making sure that we're not a threat but look at the beautiful color and detail in those feathers like I say it's not often that we get close enough that we can see all the detail but you can see those little white edges to it and cream edges and those colors are all going to change later in life and is he gonna go drink I think so looks like it how wonderful is this to see a Batelier Eagle so up close that we can actually then watch it drink. This is not very common at all for us. In fact, in my entire time at Safari Live, this is the first time that I've seen a Batelier Eagle drinking or that we've got on camera. Seb, have you ever filmed one, filmed one drinking? No, it's not a common thing at all. So it is very cool to see and it's because of how hot it is I was saying just now that it is hot and it feels like the oven doors have been left open and it's about a hundred degrees Fahrenheit 98 to be exact and 33 I mean 36 degrees Celsius so it is excessively warm out here and there is this warm wind blowing as well and it really does feel quite stifling so if you're a bird of prey with a thick feathery sort of body it must be quite nice to come down and get this cooler water from the edge of Trias Dam and you'll be surprised how cool that water actually is even in hot weather like this because it's quite a large body of water it takes some time to warm up and so that water will be nice and refreshing for a very hot bird you'll see every now and then it, that it does actually open its mouth and pant a little bit I want maybe if it's going to be a better idea Seb let's, Seb, let's try, although it's going to be quite far. I was thinking if we go around, we might get a little bit more eye level, and if it drinks, we'll get it head on as it begins to drink, which would be quite cool. There's the odd go-away bird that's also making a bit of noise. Don't chase our Batelier Eagle away, go-away bird. I'll be very upset. And the Batelier Eagle is trying to work out where exactly is best to drink from. You can see it's trying to drink from that smallish section of water that's protected a little bit by mud close towards its sort of feet because it doesn't want to get too deep into that water in case there are crocodiles in pans like this it will know that there can potentially be threats and so that's why it will try and stay away from the water's edge and try and find a little puddle somewhere where that it can drink rather than going into the actual water hole in places where you find these small little puddles they will actually wade right into their to their feathers and their feet will get wet as they then drink because they know that they don't have to worry about predators as much but you can see look at that massive eye bit of yellowing coming through on the beak so that will be eventually bright bright yellow and a bit of red will also come through as well on the face so it's going to change quite a bit from what it is now but these are the most awesome views of a Batelier Eagle that I've had in a very long time you can see the wind ruffling its feathers a little bit and that wind is so welcome as well because it is like I say stiflingly warm so the breeze at least is providing some sort of relief from what's going on oh, I wonder are you going to go forward for us come on looks like it wants to drink here we go 
I always love watching eagles walk. They don't have nearly as much grace walking as they do flying, and they look a bit awkward when they walk. They kind of waddle, much like penguins. Wendy, you say, what a stunning bird. Well, Wendy, we're being spoiled by being able to see this. Look, there we go. You see how they have to open their beak quite wide and scoop the water. Look, there we go. How cool is that? That's very, very, very epic. This is not something you're going to see every day. I know it's just a bird drinking water, but it is a very cool way to see it drink. These birds of prey with these big beaks, that you see how wide they have to open their mouth just to scoop enough water in to actually quench their thirst? It is quite incredible. There we go. Imagine it would take quite a while to scoop in that much water. Each little beakful is only going to be a few droplets, but it will still help nonetheless. And I'm sure we'll see this bird drinking for quite some time before it actually satisfies that thirst. And the grey go away birds are not impressed, though, by the battaliers approach and that it's here at the water hole they wanted to probably come down and drink and a bird of prey is always a threat even though battaliers don't hunt birds they still will see this large predatory bird and be a bit nervous of it i wonder if we can get round to the front side of that bird should we try seb we're going to just try and see if we can get round to the other side of treehouse dam and see if we can get a view of this bird drinking from the front because it'll be so nice to have its beak kind of facing towards us and watch the droplets falling out of its mouth as it drinks. I don't think if it didn't fly away when we came around the corner it should be okay for us to get around and get a little bit more eye level to it. It will definitely make for some compelling viewing that's for sure. Hello Wanderer you asking how often would a bird like this need to drink every day so you'll find birds need require water every day and these eagles do drink a lot during the middle parts of the day but because we're not really around at those times we very seldom actually see it so it's nice that we've caught this bird drinking as also because of this excessive heat it's not getting moisture from only its prey items remember lions and leopards will also get moisture from prey items and so will the eagles it's particularly battaliers because they will scavenge or fairly fresh carcasses that still have some blood in them so Seb I'm hoping from here is going to be really nice it looks like it's going to stay for us and this is going to be exactly where I want to be because it is the perfect place to see it drinking now don't go away no Egyptian geese you stay still because the Egyptian geese have just given it a little fright by fluttering across the, the water hole but there we go it's not quite as close, but we'll still get that motion of it drinking straight towards us, which will be quite special. So there we go. See? See how it scoops up? Isn't that very cool? I wonder when the last time we saw a bird of prey like this drinking was. Certainly a first for me, like I say, while I've been with Safari Live. I have seen it before, um, but not here at the lodge and, and well, at Safari Live, and not definitely not filmed it yet, that's for sure. So pity the light is the wrong side of it, but it is a much better angle from here because we can get sort of low and eye level as it goes down and scoops up bits of water. You can see it's just watching and checking the Egyptian geese that went across and then it'll start drinking again. There we go, scooping up a little bit of water. That's very cool. So you see it's just little droplets, little droplets. It's much like the cats, they don't get a lot in the beak at, as, you know, in a quick time, but they have the opportunity to spend quite a bit of time actually drinking. So, Wild Heart, you want to know how tall these birds can get. They'll get to about 70 centimeters as fully grown in terms of their height. So, 70 centimeters, just under a meter tall, basically, which is quite big. So, this bird is still immature, it's going into its sort of adult phase of life. It's probably fledged recently and has now spent a bit of its time kind of flying around. It will still probably be quite close to its natal area, so close to the nest. It hasn't shown any sign of colouring yet, so it won't be a threat to any of the adult birds and be pushed away. But it's definitely still got a bit of growing to do, so it's not fully grown just yet. So it'll get a little bit taller than what it is now, but not much. You can hear the go-away bird alarm calling at it.
So this is what these hot days bring and why checking the water holes in extremely hot weather like this is such an important thing because you're able to come across weird and wonderful things because it's dry it's hot it's driving animals that would be a little bit more shy and maybe have flown off before we got you to actually stay and drink just out of desperation so you'll find even smaller things like the nocturnal species that will come out even in the day just to try and quench their thirst I remember where the last time I saw a pangolin was in a very similar weather like this it was hot it was dry and it was that pang there was not much water around and the pangolin actually came to drink and was then at the water hole so it, it we were sitting there with a leopard funnily enough and the pangolin arrived but it just shows you that random things will come out in heat like this because it really does sap the energy from everybody and everybody requires water and so they move into these areas to try and just actually hydrate themselves and stay full of water in these dry conditions but that is wonderful well done Seb much better from here, hey, the angle at least you can see there is a bit of a breeze blowing, you can see the water is being ruffled up a little bit so that is a saving grace this afternoon, although that the w wind does feel quite warm at this stage you can see all the feathers ruffling around but you'll also notice with this battery eagle that it knows that it's somewhat vulnerable when it's drinking so you'll see it takes a quick sip and then puts its head up and watches and looks around so you would think that there wouldn't be too many predators of a big bird like this but things like martial eagles um, leopards they would easily take a bird of this size jackals if it wasn't watching what's going on so they have to be aware and they'll constantly look around after drinking making sure that they're not being caught out and something's not coming from behind or to the sides and about to grab them I love when the wind blows and f blows all those f head feathers out. And later in life he will get a big fluffy head and they'll be jet black. But you can see, look there, where they're blowing out like that. It always makes them look a bit chicken-like when they have that. I always like it. Right. Now, our Batalia eagle is still quenching its thirst so I think what we're going to do is probably leave it in peace I don't want to chase it away on a hot afternoon like this but talking about battaliers and friends and all kinds of things Brent is in the Mara and would like to say hello 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 and welcome to the marvelous Mara my name is Brent Yersmith I have man aka Craig on camera and uh, we're on a mission uh, so we are heading way down south towards the Burungat bridge uh, hoping that some wildebeest might have popped across from the other side of the river uh, and have a look around the lookout crossings an area we haven't spent a lot of time in for a while so who knows what might happen very exciting remember hashtag safari live if you've got any questions now I uh, just on my way down towards the Burungat Bridge. I wanted to go see uh, how the Paradise Pride There was some zebra massing around there, so there's always a good chance that the paradise might feel like a snack. So I thought we'd have a quick look on our way down, and uh, I'm hoping to find some wildebeest, and of course with wildebeest some lions. Oh, look at that muddy, muddy old man. You are very muddy. Hello, the old dagger boy. And you can just see some Thompson's gazelles off to the right and some impala with them. Now, the zebra that were massing seem to have disappeared. still hasn't managed to fight off his gremlins from this morning. A very good afternoon to all of you. My name is Jamie and this afternoon Manu is on camera with me once again. And we're, well, I don't really know exactly where we're going, but I had an exciting report of a female cheetah in this area this morning. Unfortunately, it was just after the sunrise safari. But due to the fact that there's no real road names, 
you so, uh, descriptions of where things are are rather vague and you tend to find yourself wandering along hoping to see a big pile of cars somewhere but this is not far away at all from where Manu and myself actually saw we suspect Kakenya's daughter so Kakenya is a quite a famous female cheetah out here I've never seen her before but she's famous because she managed to raise one litter of four cubs to adulthood successfully in one go which for cheetah is outstanding parenting skills because they do have such a tough time with their cubs so if it is her she's very close to where we last saw her and the last time we saw her she had three cubs three very tiny very fluffy little cubs now that would be a special way to spend the afternoon I just kind of have to figure out exactly where it was now the, the risk is our signal stops at a certain point so do our radio comms so everybody hope that she's close enough that we'll actually be able to we'll actually be able to share her with you and don't forget hashtag safari live on twitter is how you can get hold of us yes there's lots of vehicles that have come through here but that makes sense the border post is there and look, thank you to all of you welcoming us back i've it already feels like I've been back for ages, so I kind of forgot this is only my second drive back. It's really been lovely. I hear that the weather is stunning on Juma. It is not so stunning here. The wind was howling earlier. It's still, it's still making life difficult. Our roof is in complete disarray. The flap is everywhere, but there's no point in even trying to put it back because the wind just whips it out of your hands. But it is really lovely to be back. We had a, a very relaxing leave. Went to Naivasha, did a lot of bird watching in Nairobi. But it's good to be back in the Mara. Especially when you've got the prospect of a cheetah somewhere, somewhere in the vicinity. Our longest road is a massive old fig tree. And it's such a pity, but it's not, not forever, but for the moment our signal doesn't extend there but it is the most exquisite old tree. And Manu and I, no, it wasn't with Manu. It was with Viam. Then we had to take shelter underneath that tree during a massive storm. And it protected us almost completely. We still got a little bit damp, but its crown covers the entire car. So that I wish I could show you. One day I will. One day I'll take you to that fig tree. So I'm still, I'm trying to cover some ground bit nervous that the gremlins will start attacking us relatively soon so what we'll do is we'll send you back over to Tristan who is checking out Treehouse Dam I was Jamie but I have departed our batelier departed and so we are onwards and forwards to our next location which will be another waterhole that's where we're going to head we're going to head up to Biffleshook Dam in the hope that the Nkuhuma pride has come over I know it's it's stiflingly hot and they'll probably be sleeping if they are there but while we've got light and we've got time to work with it's always better to head into that area and try and see if we can find them while we've got it because what happens is often is the case with the Nkuhumas is that they move ah now I believe that we have something very exciting but we have a 19 second delay so I have to talk to you for 19 seconds before we can quickly link which is not going to be so quick link across to Jamie and the Mara who's got a small spotted cat <laughs> Okay, admittedly not the cheetah I was looking for, but something very exciting nevertheless. We have got a serval, and I, as I sent you across to Tristan, I saw it and slammed on my brakes, and it's hunting. It's after something. Unfortunately, if I reposition now, I think it's going to disappear. But this is the same, I'm almost certain this is our, the same serval as before, Manu. We're in almost the same area, the one that we saw kill a, a small rodent. I'm sure it's the same one. It is so relaxed around vehicles. It's such a pleasure. Can you see it? Oh, oh, what are you doing? I want to see if it's going to do that really incredible spring that Serval are renowned for. They're spectacular jumpers. 
Okay, so we got a mini cheetah. Can't complain about that. Little tail flicking. So for those of you that are unfamiliar with servals, it's essentially about, mm, I'd say twice the size of your average house cat. Not, oh, there goes leaping into the grass. That was a surprise. Let's see if, it, let's see if it's caught something. Hold on. I think I just heard a little squeak. Heads up. Okay, I think it's a girl. Looked like a girl to me. I think it's a female. Hey, girl. Gremlins General, you say poor rabbit. Look at this. Look how close she's, and it is a girl. Look how close she's let us get. Isn't this amazing? I don't know if it was a rabbit. <laughs> poor rabbit. I don't know what it was. She's got something, though. Come on. Those massive ears. I don't want her to feel uncomfortable while she's trying to consume her meal, but she seems to be quite relaxed. She is glancing back at us. Exquisite creatures. What did you catch? She definitely got something. I don't know what it was. Oh, there she goes. Hey, it's another rodent. Another bushfalt gerbil by the looks of things. That's a proper catch for the serval. How stunning is this? Manu, what is it with us in serval hunts, eh? It's going to start to become a thing. So this is the, the Lager and Love serval. She's always around here. She is. Now, lots of you saying that she is very pretty. She is, isn't she? She's absolutely gorgeous. She's, of course... Oh, oh is it still alive? She's playing with her food now. I think she might be in a very cat-like way. Did you just lose it? No, no, there it is. She is. She's playing with it. Oh, shame. Just like your house cats do at home when they catch themselves a, a hapless rodent. That's exactly what she's doing. <laughs> That's just natural instinct. Roshni, you say she seems nervous. I don't think so, Roshni. I, I think initially she did move that away from us. Uh, just a little bit into the grass. She's not nervous of us. I actually think she's quite hyped up. She's quite. She's having fun with it. Look, she's let it go and then she's catching it once again. So she's. I'm sure those of you with house cats will have seen this behaviour before. It's basically, it's instinct, and it's a great way for them to practice their skills. And you might find uh, she doesn't look that young, but she might be quite young. In which case, this is a great way for her to essentially hone her hunting technique. I don't think she's nervous, she's twitchy, but that's because she's excited and she's playing with it. James, absolutely, we are so spoiled with the serval sightings in the Mara. They just are so much more relaxed here. And actually, servals are quite easy to habituate if you can find them. Oh, pounce again. You see, she's letting it go, she's letting it think that it's free, and then she pounces and grabs it again. And they are quite, they're like cheetah in that respect. They, they get relaxed around people quite quickly. And I suspect if we had the time and we could track them, which of course we can't, they would habituate very quickly to people on foot as well, which would be astounding to be able to follow a serval around. She got it again. Oh, shame. Stop torturing the poor thing. It's always hard to watch, but that's very much a human perspective. From her perspective, this is her afternoon game plus a meal.
redhead, Tom. And much like cheetah, yes, serval do domesticate very easily. And there is a breed of cat called a savanna cat because they are closely related. They're in the same family um, and the same genus as domestic cats. They are able to reproduce with domestic cats. And there's a type of cat called a savanna cat, which is kind of a mixture of a serval and a, and a domestic cat. Personally, and I, we often go on about this, it's been a while since we've done the the talk about it personally and i think we all feel the same i really don't believe in that sort of thing oh there we go she's finally eating it i think it's i think it's human it's basically a human ego boost to want to have an exotic pet or exotic animal as a pet we've got cats we've got dogs they've been domesticated for tens of thousands of years in certain cases they need us and that's fine though you know We've got companionship in the form of pets. We really don't need to add wild animals to our list. They belong wild. But yes, people have domesticated servals. I actually know people who've raised serval. And just an important lesson, serval are okay to domesticate. They tend to be like cheetah. They tend to be quite even-tempered. Caracal, which is the other medium-sized cat, well, I know I, all of the cases I know have ended in tragedy with domesticated caracal just like that entire rodent swallowed whole you are going to cough up one big hairball i imagine oh she's exquisite isn't she the grace and the lines of her body so this is for roshni who's saying that she looks nervous she's walking right at us now or right next to us She's going to walk right past the car, not quite right past the car, but right in front of us. Oh, wow. Look at this. Right, well, there's our afternoon plan for now. Sina, I'm not sure how old this cat is. It's fully grown. She is fully grown, and she seems to have a territory here. I'm pretty sure it's her, but just like Cheetah, actually, here's a really good idea. I hope that those of you with um, who are watching have got some screenshots to share on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. I don't because my I don't have a camera because Brent's got my lens. Naturally, his is broken. So if you get screenshots of her spot patterns, we can actually determine with absolute certainty if it's the same serval that we saw hunting the other night because oh, that's quite a while ago now uh, what are we talking about oh her age i think she's established but i don't know how old she is janet you say you've never seen you've never seen a serval on camera before well there you go i'm very glad to have provided you with this opportunity and manu of course doing an amazing job look at that she's stalking down the road just like a cheetah I am going to stick with our serval for as long as possible. Oh, beautiful. While she wanders down the road and I catch up, let's go back over to Brent, who has found one of the most iconic male lions in the world. It is the, the, the king of the crossings at Scarface himself, looking quite lethargic uh, on the edge of a croton thicket. Not far from where we saw the Paradise Pride girls this morning. There he is, look at him as he lifts his head and looks at us. And that very, very iconic face. Oh, he's a bit of a tired kitty at the moment. But at least his head's up and he's not a flat cat. So I'm pretty sure... The Paradise Pride will be around here somewhere. And, um, you know, it's maybe avoiding him as there's not too much to eat around. So I don't, probably don't want to share. He is an absolutely gorgeous lion, though. magnificent now of course he is part of for those of you who don't know part of a coalition of uh, three other males uh, known as the musketeers not to be confused with the cheetah musketeers uh, it's the lion musketeers and they dominate the area around the main river crossings 
Hello, Alex. Alex is wondering, do cats have predators? Uh, well, it... Oh, I suppose uh, to a degree, yes, um, but normally it'll be pred uh, or competition rather than predators. So lion will kill leopard, uh, leopard will kill lion cubs, lion will kill hyena, hyena will kill lion, and vice versa, and that goes all the way down to the little cats. So it's very different. It's not because of um, to eat in most cases. It's 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 due to try remove any form across the... Oh, quickly across to Jamie! Our servo is at it once again. She's heard something in the grass. So I, I didn't want to tear you away from Scar so quickly, but I do want you to be able to watch the behavior. And I kind of, we kind of missed the hunt earlier. And I love watching this because it's something so unique. It's a completely, I guess in a way, it's almost a leopard-like technique, but they get so much closer. And watch the way she's using those ears. There's a really proper visual communication stripe right there with the white and the black. Oh, whatever it was, she seems to have lost interest. She was stalking towards that area. You can see her turning her head constantly, stopping. Oh, 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 did she get it? An amazing change of direction. She heard something. It, the rodent obviously popped its head out of its hole or something similar. And she immediately bounded back, but I think she was too far, surely she was too far, to have caught it. Ah, I think she missed that one. Good try, though. Bound, bound. Nicely done, Manu. That was a surprise change in direction. And there she goes, off again. Looking for all the world, apart from the, the short tail, she looks for all the world like a little mini cheetah. Sharp face, though. They've got very sharp faces. No, I didn't do it. Welcome back to the Sunset Safari. I didn't do it. Servals do have den sites for their cubs. Um, I've actually even heard of them going into old abandoned holes to keep their little, actually kittens, to keep their kittens safe. Um, but they'll also use, exactly like leopards or lions will do, they'll use some dense vegetation, perhaps underneath a thick gardenia bush, for example, something where there's plenty of cover, hollows in trees, is another place, especially if there's a hollow at the base of the tree, they'll hide their kittens there. And one thing I've noticed from following the one serval around near the Sausage Tree Pride Territory, one thing I've noticed about them is that they do tend to utilize overhangs of, of drainage lines, so the, the dried up riverbeds, they often seem to be popping out of, or one in particular seems to pop out of that area a lot. Let's go a little bit closer since she is so very obliging and so comfortable with vehicles as she hunts in the long grass again. And the serval sightings have just got better and better and we actually have the wildebeest to thank for it because we can see they've eaten all the grass and they've actually been very much assisted us, well they have very much assisted us in clearing some space so we can see the servals that we find. There she goes, stalking forward again. I think she spotted something. David, I've never seen a serval sleeping out in the open. Um, I've only ever seen them sleeping or disturbed them sleeping under bushes and safe places, places where they can be hidden. I think they don't really, a, a lion knows that it's the top predator out here essentially, whereas a serval doesn't have that luxury. And anything, any of the big cats that came across a serval will try and kill it. In fact, our, our last TV show episode, five minutes before we had the sausage tree pride hunting a serval, it was terrifying. They were so close to catching that serval that lives in their drainage line, or lives around that drainage line. So there are too many threats out here. A leopard, a hyena, a lion, che even cheetah will kill a serval if they have an opportunity. Oh, she trots. Let's try to get a bit closer. I actually, David, 
in Napa. David, you, I don't know. I don't know if, the, if I would consider them the most successful hunters out here because, to be completely honest with you, I haven't spent enough time with servals. I haven't spent enough time following them around. I don't know what their success rate is. From what I've seen, the efforts that we've seen, they seem to be highly successful. Let's just take our revs down a little bit while we follow her. I would suggest that they're more successful than something like a cheetah or a lion, except during the migration, of course. That, that skews all statistics. I don't know, David. I don't know if there's actually even any literature on serval success rate. There must be. There must be. Let's see her going into stalk mode again. Let's stop and watch her. Well, if any of you do know of articles with serval hunting success rate, if you could send that through on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, I would be very much appreciative. Because I'm honestly not sure. Well, let me let me put it this way: of the two start to finish hunts we've we've witnessed so far it was two out of three in terms of success not really much to build a data set not really a data set though is it we can't draw any conclusions from that Aaron the agility was amazing wasn't it the way that she changed direction I suppose that they're, they're very very similar to house cats in that respect lightning fast reflexes what I really would love to see and love to show you is the way that they jump up into the air. They're famous for flushing birds. Things like sand grouse and other bird species that spend a lot of time on the ground. And they leap up and catch them in mid-flight. I've only ever seen it twice. And unfortunately, neither of those times was even when I was working with Safari Live. But that extraordinary leap up into the air. You can see how powerful and how long their back legs are and how long their bodies are. She's turning back. Maggie, um, serval are solitary creatures. They're solitary cats. Very similar to something like a, a leopard. So you'll have their, the females have their territory. They're territorial. The females will have their territories. The males will have their territories. There'll be a degree of overlap with males having slightly larger territories and the only time you'll really see them socializing is when they're either mating or when a female has kittens but animals are odd things especially cats as we've seen with leopards I wouldn't be surprised if there's situations where you see more than one serv adult serval associating with each other what's up girl what are you after Imagine if serval was, were um, social, like lions. Imagine seeing a little pride of servals wandering through. VM would love that. That would be right up VM's alley. Servals are VM's second most favorite thing to film. Uh, see now, um, servals are protected in as much as they, they live in reserves that are protected, where all of the wildlife is protected, um, and certainly here in Kenya. However, I don't think that they're classified in terms of their, um, their red list classification. I think they're probably not listed as vulnerable yet. I think they're actually relatively common. More common than perhaps even we realize. Let's go forward a bit so that money's got a view. I think potentially more common than we realize. They're just secretive, so we hardly ever see them. They don't have, I don't think they're on, it's not on the same level as something like a, a rhino or a pangolin that sits on, in terms of non tradable animal parts, it sits on the first appendix. Where is she? There she is, there she is, there she is. I think she's having a drink, actually. And a little lugger. Just see her tail twitching there. And I would say that the biggest threat to serval would be, obviously, habitat loss. And then you'll probably find, I don't think they're uh, animal trafficking, potentially, I suppose, the exotic pet trade. And then also snares, bushmeat snares. They would be potential victims, especially with their tendency to wander about in the way that they do, would place them highly at risk. Is 
bush going back towards the main road. She's using this little... She's using this little dip to remain hidden. And Jerry, you want to know if she's a kind of lynx. Did I hear that correctly, Alice? Let me just check that I got it right. Uh, no, not not in so much as she is. Obviously, she is a, a cat, so it's part of the same family. Um, she is related to, but not a type of lynx. She's a different genus. Wait, hold on. Lynxes, lynxes are. Give me one second. The brain's the brain's shifting. She no, she's in the same genus. Lynxes are felis, so are so are um, so are serval. So they are related to each other. They are in the same genus. Obviously, different continents. Um, you'll find that the the animal that is more similar to a lynx is the caracal. The most beautiful cat. Have we ever seen one on a live safari? I've, I haven't shown you one. Perhaps you have. In, in, in terms of safari lives history and wild earth history, those of you who have been watching for many years, have you ever seen a caracal on the live safaris? Or is that something that we still have to do? That's something we have to add to your list. Oh, sorry, I was having a blonde moment. Lynxes are feelers, so it's the same genus. Where is she going? There she is. She's coming back again. She's just stalking up and down this um this little dip. Looking again for potential prey. The Felis family, of course, African wild cats, your domestic cats, caracals, servals, all of the small and medium sized cats. Imagine if we could follow her for days at a time. Uh, now, we have a question. I, I mentioned earlier that she's a female. Uh, we have a question about what the difference is between a male and a female serval. None, mass, no massive differences, uh, just in terms of size. The male's a little bit bigger, but it's not as noticeable as, for example, the difference between a male and a female leopard. So the way that I determined was to, was in the sort of the normal way, which was to check underneath her tail and just see whether or not I could see any protruding parts that would belong to a boy. And she definitely doesn't have them. I don't know what it is. I think it's the fact that her eyes are quite gummy. Makes her look older than perhaps she is. Oh, she's going to go right behind us. Let's just sit still. Maybe she'll come and use us as cover. Look at this. This is so cool. <laughs> this is the best wild serval sighting I've ever had. She's walking right behind us. I can't do anything now. I have to just sit. I didn't do it. Yes, serval scent mark, just like um, cats do. Ur urine would be the predominant scent marking. Oh, goodness, sorry. I'm having an earpiece nightmare of a day. So urination would be the main way that they scent mark. And yes, they're territorial, so they do. Manu, can you see her? Yeah. Is she going back? Yeah. Is she close? She's here, between, in the gap. I don't want to startle her. How close would you say she is? Maybe 20 meters. 20 meters, okay, we can, then we can move. This is amazing. I'm going to spend as much time as I can with this serval. It's extraordinary. Let's go back while we reposition. Let's go to Tristan, who's with some, well, let's just say slightly larger cats. 
I do indeed, and you can see they're in a state of recline. They're hot and bothered, but they're lying underneath the bushes is the entire Inkuuma pride and our injured lioness. So for those of you who are a bit squeamish, it's probably a good thing to look away now, as you'll see her hip is not in good condition at all. It is fairly mangled, unfortunately, so there is a bit of a wound, saying likely that there is serious damage to that left hip. Now, the thing is, is that she is walking fine. I spoke to the guys that saw her walking this morning. Apparently she's walking just fine, so it looks worse than it actually is. It's just that her skin has peeled off, basically, from the muscle, and that's why it looks really, really nasty, and it looks a lot worse than it probably actually is, and I'm sure she will recover from it. As long as she's able to get food and water, she'll be fine, but it is a nasty wound. How she got it, no idea. Um, they went into the Kruger National Park. They were absolutely fine, all five of them. They went into the Kruger, and they came back and she had that wound. Not one of the other lionesses is sporting a wound at all, so I really don't know what happened to her. She's one of the the mothers of the original cubs, so she's not the mother of the of the new cubs, but I don't know what's happened to her and how what's caused that. There's no other scratch on her, there's no bite marks on her rest of her body. So I really, really well and truly don't know what could have caused that. But either way, it must be seriously uncomfortable. In heat like this, with the amount of flies that are around, she must be driven absolutely mad. You can see she's actually not even going to lie on that hip at all. She'll probably just lie the way she is for the next few weeks while that starts to dry and to heal up a little bit. And only once it's actually healed a bit will she start to lie on that left side again. The good news is that the female with the cubs is here. She's lying just to the left there. So that female there, she is very thin at the moment, but you can see she still does have milk and has still got suckle marks. So that's a quite a good sign that those cubs are still alive. And it's not unusual to see lionesses that are a little bit on the skinnier side when they've got cubs, particularly if she's the only lioness in the pride that's got them because she's having to spend a lot of time away from the pride, tracking back and forth, trying to feed them. The, the cubs are absorbing a lot of nutrients from her and she's spending a lot of time on her own, which means she's not going to be feeding as well as everybody else and that means she's going to be a little bit on the skinnier side, but nothing to worry about. She's still absolutely fine and, and like I say, the good thing is that there's still milk there, so it means she is producing and hopefully the cubs are fine. Mooks, you're worried about an infection on this lioness. Well, it is a possibility that they could get it, but you'll be surprised how resilient these animals are. She'll groom that all the time. She's going to lick it. She's going to clean it. She might get a little bit of infection, but as long as she's getting food and water, her body should be, over to be able to overcome it. It's, it's a nasty wound for sure but I have seen worse on lions and I've seen them come back from worse. So it's just gonna look really bad for a while, but once it's kind of dried up a little bit and, and that skin starts to heal and starts to scar, you'll find that it's not gonna be as bad and she should make a full recovery. I was alluding to the fact this morning about Mfumo's face when he had that massive hole in his face and everybody thought that he was going to die and that this is the end of him but you will be surprised just how strong these animals are. And you might be wondering why we haven't interfered and tried to dart this Inkuma female and treat that wound. Well, the simple fact of the matter is that it's been caused by nature. So if she were not to survive, unfortunately, I know it's a hard stance to take, but unfortunately, when these animals are injured in nature, sometimes it's nature's way of just getting rid of a bloodline that is slightly weaker than others. And you do see it happening and, and Imagine how many impalas and wildebeest and zebras and varying other animals have walked around here with similar wounds that have not even been looked at twice because they are not a lioness. So it's just a blanket rule that we use and it means that there's no black and white or gray, I mean there's no gray area, it's just black and white, is that if an animal is affected by us as people, we will try and fix it. But if it isn't affected by an animal, then, well, these animals have to try and sort of come right or the nutrients that they would provide will then go back into the soil. I know it's a really horrible way to think about things and especially when it's lionesses or leopards that we see daily and we we get to know really well but in this situation here like I say it looks a lot worse than it actually is. It's um, It's more a flesh wound and a skin wound than it is a deep sort of laceration or any sort of breakage of the bone. And the fact that she's moving absolutely fine and walking without a limp means that she's actually not sustained too much damage. It'll be a bit tender, that's for sure, and it'll look quite nasty, 
but that should come right. It's just going to be a bit of a mission to keep clean and to make sure that she doesn't get too much of an infection. What we actually need is those flies to land there and, and for maggots to start cleaning it out because maggots, even though it looks really bad, are actually not the worst thing. I remember Fumo's face had a few maggots in them and that helped just clean the wound and get that nice healthy skin and eventually it will all stitch together but it will take some time for her to come right. I still just can't work out what's actually happened to her. I mean, it must have been... A m uh, maybe a male or another female grabbed her by the rump there and pulled and that ripped the skin. But uh, it's really an odd wound because she's got not one other mark on her. So there's no cuts around her face or her front legs or bite marks on her back, which would be typical of a fight. So how she's gotten that, I don't really know. And it's not typical of a hunting injury. David, do you think buffalo will? That's what I was just about to say that buffalo don't cause injuries like that. It's it's very seldom that you'd find a buffalo causing a, almost scrape injury. That this is that you know buffaloes generally you'll find a horn injury or a, a broken leg from an impact. Is very seldom that you'll see a sort of a ripping wound like that without a hole somewhere there. There's no evidence of a hole where a horn could have gone in to break that skin like that. So I'm not sure. I, my, my suggestion or well, my guess would be more another predator or a particular lion. Maybe hyenas, it's also possible. I've seen quite a few lionesses with bad injuries to their tail from hyenas, because hyenas will try to go around the back and nip and bite around the tail area. In fact, the Salala lions, we know that there's been two different females that lost their tails due to hyenas. And the one female that we have that's currently alive from the Salalas that lost her tail, she had extensive bite wounds around that tail. It was actually because I saw her about two, three days after it happened, and the tail itself was completely stripped of meat. There was actually a piece of bone that eventually fell off, and then there was these kind of similar wounds all around her back legs and feet and on her on her bum area. So it's a similar wound to what you'd see from hyenas. But far more restful and far more sort of content are the rest of the pride that are all sitting around in the quarry thickets. The cubs all look fairly good. Um, so they don't, they're not full, 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 but they're all looking healthy and happy, which is great news. Now, Faisal, you reckon that maybe a territorial fight. Well, that's what I would lean towards. You know, they went way out of their territory. Why they went there, I'm not quite sure at all. Because they went right down towards Nkoro, and then from Nkoro crossed into the Kruger National Park, which is in a very different area than the Nkumas have been in a very long time. So maybe they bumped into the Torchwood Pride. They could have bumped into other male lions there that they don't know. They could have bumped into other females. You know, there are females around Hamilton's, Hoya Hoya, that area. So it's very possible that they bumped into some other predators uh, particularly lions and had a bit of a territorial dispute and that's what it's, has happened. The thing about a territorial dispute and particularly with lions is that you, there's no way the rest of the pride would have just dropped and ran and left this female all to herself. They would never have just said, you know, we're not going to defend her and you would have found some of the others having injuries if they got into a really big fight. The only way that this could have happened is that she was separated by from the rest of the pride and then this happened but I would imagine then she would have sported a lot more bite wounds from other lions. I think this is more likely hyenas work than anything else, but it's all speculation. It's really difficult to know without actually being there and seeing what's happening. And also the way she's lying at the moment, I can't see what the top of the wound looks like and whether there's a mark on the top where you could actually see a hole or a bite or something like that. So maybe when she stands up a bit later, because we will spend time with the Nkuma Pride and I'm sure they're gonna head down to Bufflesook Dam for a drink this evening. And maybe when she does that, then we'll be able to see whether there's actually marks of canines or any sort of sign of teeth that are around that wound or what could have potentially caused it. But like I say, as much as it looks nasty and as much as it probably hurts her, she will come right from this. I, I really don't think it's as bad as it looks. Sometimes these wounds look worse than they really are. And that's, I suppose, easy for us to say when we don't have a massive chunk missing out of our backside. But she seems to be okay. She's, like I say, the fact that she's moving and the fact that she's walking without a limp is generally a good indication that there's no real physical damage to bone or ligament structure and it's just a muscular skin structure and that will eventually grow back as long as she keeps it clean and is well fed and well hydrated then she should be okay and the rest of her body condition is good you know this although this only happened three four days ago because that's when they went into the kruger the rest of her looks absolutely fine she's not showing any sort of signs of discomfort besides that nasty gash on her bum 
So I think she wants to roll over, but it's probably a little bit painful to lie on still. It's still a bit too fresh to actually be putting too much weight on. It's like when you ever have a burn with friction wound so if you fall over on like t tar or asphalt or something like that you know it's the skin is very sensitive to the touch for a few days and so I'm sure that's the same with this and only once it starts to stitch and heal a little bit will she be able to roll over onto that other side so she'll probably be a bit uncomfortable for the next little bit and this heat really can't be helping it must be a little unpleasant when it comes to heat. As you can see the rest of the pride is completely at home in this quarry bush they found themselves the smallest bit of shade possible I don't know why they're not lying further down because down in the drainage is a beautiful sandy cool area and maybe during the middle of the day there was no shade there but now it would be the perfect place for lions to lie the bank is making this nice long shadow and the sands quite moist there so I would imagine it would be a lot cooler and a lot more comfortable for these lions down there than it is where we are now See, like you're wondering what weather lions can withstand. Well, lions are fairly widespread. If you think about it, there are lions in the, in the desert areas where temperatures can really soar into the high 120s Fahrenheit or, or close to 50 degrees Celsius. In fact, more in the sun in those desert sections. And then if you go into the very same deserts in the winter months it can often drop below freezing and the lions are able to survive there so it is possible that they can oh, is it a bit stiff my girl shame you can see the way she's rolling it's a little on the stiff side and there's no other wounds I can see on her left flank is there no nothing there but she is a little bit stiff and you can see she's trying to keep that hip off the ground so she's just twisted her body a little bit but she seems fairly content at this stage. She doesn't seem as though she's too bad. Let's see if she rolls all the way over and actually puts some pressure on it. So they can actually withstand quite a lot. And if you think about lions that are in the zoos across the world, there are lions that are in Berlin, for example, where it snows sometimes. And so you'll find a situation where, you know, they can withstand that. But what will happen with lions is that their coats will change a little bit. So if they're in a place like Berlin let's say and they're in a zoo there their lions will get big and fluffy and they'll become the coats become thick and so that they insulate better whereas here in Africa you'll find that they'll have a very fine coat and even here in the winter and summer the coat will change slightly it will thicken a little bit during the winter months and then thin out as we get into these hotter summer temperatures like we have now you can see they're not too bad though because none of them are fully panting if it was really excessively hot and they'd eaten a lot you would have found that their breathing rate would be super quick, their mouths would be open as they use the evaporation and, and the moisture on the tongue that would evaporate when panting to cool that blood on the tongue and mouth and send the cooler blood back into the body. But in this case, they found some shade and a bit of a breeze and they seem to be okay. So that's fairly good and I'm surprised actually because I thought they would have been a lot hotter than what they are. But just in terms of numbers with the Nkuma Pride, in, in, especially if there's a wound on one of them, it's always good just to check how many are here. But all five females are here, and, and I counted five cubs at least, and I think there's the sixth one is further on where I can't see. So it looks like all the Pride is here. There's no sign of any males, so I think the Birminghams are not here at the moment. There's probably one Birmingham that's in Buffalo's Hook that we know of, close to where Mvula was this morning, and then two in Torchwood. I don't, like I say, know where the fourth one is, but no sign of any of the Birminghams here with these lionesses at the moment but it's all very sedate at this stage I was kind of hoping that we would come to Buffalsook Dam and there'd be some elephants around and we'd be able to spend some time with the Ellies and wait for our lions to wake up because I think they're going to be seriously sleepy until the sun starts to set it's going to be one of those days where it's going to take them a while the thing is though is that they're very skinny and that means that they will be on the move tonight and they will be looking for food I doubt that they're going to sit around too long I'm sure they're going to make use of the nighttime conditions and particularly because we've just come from a full moon period and we know that full moon periods it's a lot more difficult for our cats to hunt and so now they'll try and utilize that moon still down in the early hours of the evening because remember the moonrise will be around sort of midnight at the moment just after midnight and it will still be quite bright and so they'll try and use the sort of first part of the night when it's dark there's a bit of a wind today's been hot which means that a lot of the daylight animals have really kind of been battered by the sun and will be a little lethargic tonight which will be perfect for the lions to then try and take advantage but 
I'm sure, like I say, that they'll go for a drink before they're going to do anything else. So we'll be patient and wait and just see and hope they're going to go down to drink because it will be beautiful if they do. But talking about patience and luck, it seems Jamie has managed to find her serval again and must be beaming at the thought of this sighting. It is absolutely safe to say that this is the longest I have ever spent with a serval in my entire life. This is phenomenal. And this is going to be the plan for the rest of the drive unless I lose her, I think. It's going to be interesting trying to follow her at night as it gets dark, but this is definitely what we're going to do. Right, obviously my brain is still on holiday because I owe you all a sincere apology. Uh, first of all, of course Taylor saw a caracal on cheetah planes. I remember that. I was on leave, but I remember how excited she was. And I remember that we spent ages looking for it after, or the, the weeks after she found it. The th second point is that I'm talking utter nonsense about the genus. It is not Felis. I didn't know that. And the only reason I double-checked it was because something was ringing alarm bells in my mind. I always assumed it was a Felis. It's not. It's not part of that genus. It is called... Leptellarus. Leptellarus serval? It's in its own complete distinct genus. So it's related, obviously, closely enough that it can interbreed with cats, with members of, of Felis genus, but it is not in the genus Felis. <laughs> Starts to rhyme after a while. Leptellarus. L-E-P-T-A-I-L-U-R-U-S. Somewhere around my law professor is bemoaning the lack of Latin education that we all had as in, <laughs> during our school years. But anyway, there you go. I got the genus completely wrong. I apologize. Obviously, the brain is still on holiday. She seems to be taking, speaking of holidays, she seems to be taking a short break. Speaking of lying out in the open, I think that they do do it, but they don't rest as comfortably as lions do. So they don't fall fast asleep. She's got to remain alert. She could easily find herself in an awkward position, especially out here in the open, where she can't get up a tree or away from a potential predator. Now, Sinak, the long legs are built for, designed for jumping. So whilst they are relatively fast runners, they obviously don't have the same turn of speed that something like a cheetah does, but they are built for powerful, powerful leaps and their ability to catch birds. So they do leap up. They're not... I've seen them climb. Um, I don't think that they're particularly well adapted. I think they can climb. I, I haven't seen it very often. I don't think they're as limber in trees as something like a leopard might be. But they can climb, but essentially those long legs are for those pounces that we've seen her make. And when you see them sort of, they almost seem to hover in the air with all those, with all four legs tucked up under them as they move in to catch their prey. But they do have very long legs. And of course, the savannah cats that we were talking about, that's one of the characteristics of that particular breed. What is utterly devastating, well, I find it quite devastating, is the first thing when I googled serval, while I was sitting here waiting while you were with Tristan, the first thing that came up was how much is a serval, I think, or, or where can I buy a serval, or something like that. That was the first thing that came up. Terribly distressing, folks. If you have any desire to buy a serval, please just go to your shelter and adopt something. Adopt a cat, adopt a dog. Don't go out and buy a serval or a savannah cat. Oh, Lynn, gosh, I have absolutely no idea how many serval are in the Mara. I would say lots. I would say they're, they're quite a high-density animal. I have little to no idea if I had to guess. I mean, the, the whole of the Mara, okay, let's, let's just take the triangle, which is where we are at the moment. From the triangle, I would, gosh, I'd guess, I think, you're probably looking at at least 100 individuals, probably even more. I, I really am not sure. I think it would be utterly fascinating to actually do a proper population count. I'm not sure how you do it. Camera traps, maybe? Um, I guess that would probably be one way to go about it. You'd have to have a lot of camera traps, though. Hmm. Very good question. I'll I'll try and see if there, there must be somebody who's researched servals here before. There must be. <laughs> There's so many researchers around. 
Uh, James, when it comes to the mating process, with the you want to know who seeks out which, whether male or female, seek each other out. It's often the female that is the most vocal about advertising her Easter cycle. So very similar to leopards, um, uh, what they do is they scent mark. I, I've seen it once before with a domesticated serval. Lots of scent marking, urine spraying, and quite a high-pitched, almost meowing sound that they make. And that's the way that they announce that they're in estrus. And that obviously the male will then pick up on that sound, pick up on that scent, and he will then, they'll kind of come together or meet together. But essentially it's the female that initiates that whole process. And it's not, uh, as far as I know, it's it's not a protracted estrus cycle, not like a, with a leopard. I think it's only really around about four or five days. And then they separate once again. I know that there are serval kittens on the other side of the river with a very relaxed female. Imagine if we got to know this female's movements. Imagine. And we saw her with kittens. Wouldn't that be spectacular? I don't think she... I can't see any suckle marks. So I don't think that she has kittens. But imagine. Nora, um, you're looking at... Oh, there she is. She disappears. It's actually quite extraordinary. So, Nora, you're looking at around about three to four kittens that they will have. And they will, as I spoke, or as we spoke about before, they will hide them away in den sites. And then their mortality rate, I don't know. I would guess that their mortality rate is quite high. I would say that it's not quite as high as something like a cheetah, which has an absolutely massive, potentially around about 80% mortality rate before their first year, sometimes even more, depending on the situation and depending on the density of lions. So I would, I would put it, if I had to guess, at around about 50%. It's, it's always a struggle for predators to raise youngsters. And there's so many things that must threaten a serval kitten, but I'm not sure the exact number. Deadhead Tom, speaking of, of, of course, the biggest threat when we think of cub mortality, um, with lions, of course, it's strange males that are often the, the ones responsible for the death of the cubs because they kill them to bring them back into estrus. I don't think that that, co that behavior is very common in serval. I don't think it's, it's particularly common. I think it would be quite unusual. It makes sense for that to happen. I mean, leopards do it, lions definitely do it because they've got such a short time to breed. But I don't, I, serval are not a particularly antagonistic species. They stay out of each other's way. They have their territories, they have their home ranges. But I mean, I would say that serval fights are very, very unusual. I don't think it's that common. What would happen if a male encountered a female with little ones? I think they'd probably go their separate ways. Remember, there's also not as big of a sexual dimorphism between the males and the females. Yes, the, the males are stronger, but not by a huge amount. And the female's probably more than capable of defending her cubs. Whereas with a, a lioness, she could potentially be 70, 80 kilograms lighter than the male. She's much, much smaller. Leopards, again, they're half the size of the males, almost. So they, they don't have a chance to defend their cubs, whereas I think a serval could put up a pretty big fight if she had to. So I don't think that behavior is common. I think we'll learn a great deal more as we spend more and more time, hopefully, with this particular serval. That would be spectacular. Patrick, they are not particularly noisy. They don't call or roar. Well, obviously they don't roar. I, I meant they're not as vocal as lions roaring or leopards sawing, for example. They do meow and they do there's soft sort of chirping contact calls, similarish to a cheetah. Little soft calls, but for the most part they are relatively silent. Again, as I said, a female in estrus, she does make quite a bit of noise. She yowls a little bit. Now, I'll 
Pride is still fast asleep at the moment. You can see the eyes are closed behind the grass. and So we've repositioned slightly so we can see all of the little cubs because we've decided, well, the wound is the wound. It's a mystery and we're going to just carry on with the day and try and look at more happier things, which is the Pride lying underneath the trees and having a really kind of close-up cuddle. You'd think in this heat that they would try and spread themselves out a little bit, but no, everybody's in a tight-knit ball here and again they're all pretty much touching each other. So you can kind of find a common link between them all. They all seem to be in some way touching somewhere along the body. So it's quite funny to see again it's a carpet of lions as they sleep their way along. Now apparently there is an elephant slowly but surely making its way up this side. It's coming from Nyala Road north and heading northwards so I'm sure it's going to arrive at the dam just now. It won't be in the next sort of 10-15 minutes but it should be here at some point and that might be quite interesting to see what the lions do when that elephant bull arrives and to see if they actually try and kind of or if the elephant bull smells them and comes this way or if they just watch it from here and get a bit of an idea of to go down to the water. What has been quite interesting while we've been sitting here is the grey go-away birds. They have not kept quiet for one second. They've been just alarm calling after alarm call after alarm call after alarm call. Now generally with sleeping lions like this, you won't find go-away birds making this much noise. They kind of make it when the lions are walking around, but otherwise they don't. So I think there must be maybe some sort of bird of prey here, maybe an owl somewhere in this general vicinity. We know they make a lot of noise when they see owls. So I think there must be something else other than the lions because generally after the lions are fast asleep like this and are not really paying attention, the go-away birds keep quiet. But these, this bunch is just going on and 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 on. So interesting though. Look at that one, it's got its paws completely suspended off the ground. It's busy resting them on a quarry branch. <laughs> it can't be comfortable at all. The positions lions get themselves into in sleeping just looks so uncomfortable. Those legs are off the ground. This other lioness has got her head twisted up and against the back of another one, which must be so hot in these conditions. So that doesn't look very comfortable at all. And then, well, if you've got a lioness sleeping on your back, it also can't be that comfy. So those three there are not even exactly the, the most comfortable situations. But I suppose if you're a lion, you just don't care, which is fine. I reckon. Seb, this is how you would sleep, eh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes. <yeah>. Sometimes. <laughs> Brian, you're wondering if the lions snore. Um, I have heard uh, the Birmingham males every now and then making a bit of a snoring noise, but generally, no, not really. Uh, most of the time, they're actually quite s quiet sleepers. You will hear them taking big, deep breaths, but in terms of snoring not really like i ha like i say i have heard the birmingham's once or twice but this in kahuma pride i've never heard any of these females snoring maybe they have at some point but i certainly haven't heard it you can see one female's catching flies at the back there so you can see the flies are irritating her and she doesn't even have the wound so every now and then you'll watch them they'll pop their head up and they try and snap at the flies we saw asana doing it last night it's a common thing for cats is that they get so irritated after a while that they try and kind of bite at the flies. Of course they generally are so slow that they miss them altogether. And the reason why the flies congregate around their face is particularly their nose and their mouth. I was talking earlier about when they're panting and that the saliva and, and the, the moisture that evaporates um, and cools their blood down. It's the same thing. There's moisture there and the flies actually come and sequester the moisture off of that area. So the nose, the gum lines, the mouth if they've got their mouth open is where flies will often congregate to try and get some of the moisture rather than going down to a water hole or something like that. They do it off the lines themselves, which is, I suppose, very uncomfortable. You can imagine flies going in your ears, especially sensitive hearing like they've got. It must be absolutely awful. They also have hairy ears, which means that they must disturb the hair in the ear and must be quite itchy at times. But that is about as content a pride as you could imagine. Zed, you're wondering if their children sleep with them or will they always go to the den? Well, Zed, it depends on the age. So as you can see here, there's a whole bunch of smaller lions in amongst the adult females. And these are all now sub-adults, so they're still dependent on their mothers, but they're lying with the pride and travel with the pride everywhere now, so they don't go anywhere. But the one female, she has fairly new cubs. In fact, those cubs must be now approaching about six weeks old, and actually we can start trying to look for the den a lot more now. Once they reach six to eight weeks, we can go and check up on the den 
fairly regularly so they will be more in the den and won't be coming to carcasses yet so she'll travel from the pride to the den and back to the pride and, and back and forth but won't bring the cubs to the den just yet once they reach about 12 weeks that's when she'll start introducing them to carcasses so if they let's say the incumbents bring down a buffalo she'll go fetch them from the den bring them let them start feeding off a little bit of meat and introducing them to the pride once they reach about six months then they generally are walking around with the pride pretty much all the time in fact even from about four or five months they're starting to walk around with the pride and then they go and, and they get to then the size that these ones are which is a year old and they're pretty much a fully functioning member they're not quite hunting yet but they are in the pride and watching the hunts so they'll be close by they just don't participate too much in what's going on only once they reach about two and a half three are they then starting to hunt so that's the kind of span of of these uh, lions and you'll find that generally the females like I say bring their cubs to the pride as quick as possible because it takes a lot of energy for them to go back and forth from a den it also means that they miss the pride the pride could go off hunting and to find the pride again is a difficult job they've got a contact call they've got to look they've got to try and track them down and that exerts more energy than they need so as soon as they can get the cubs to the pride and get the cubs walking with the pride the better so it's not too long that that happens so it'll be another two months, I would say, for this f youngest female with the newer cubs until they with the pride more often than not. But that is one sleepy lion at the back there. It's taking it very easy. You can see how they use their paws for pillows a lot of the time. It's not the most comfortable position. Generally, when they're very tired, they don't lie like that. They more lie on their sides like the rest of the pride is doing. That seems to be a lot more comfortable for them when they're very sleepy like that and so you'll find it's only when they've woken up a bit and looked around that you'll see their heads on their paws Mishman you're wondering if these big cats like lions eat grass to settle their stomachs like domestic cats do they do indeed so lions leopards cheetah i've seen them all doing it and even wild dogs they'll also consume grass from time to time but lions and cheat and leopards all the time especially in the summer months you find they feed a lot of green green grass and so they will eat and chomp away for a while and it all just helps with settling of the stomach and also, sometimes it will help with the regurgitation process that will then get rid of all of the bone and fur that they're battling to digest inside their stomachs. But you can hear those go-away birds going crazy. They're just on the top of a knob thorn not too far away, sitting there and they're kind of calling and they, it's almost like surround sound because I've got go-away birds behind me and I've got go-away birds in front of me and it's not the best surround sound to be honest. They are nice to hear every now and then but not constantly for 45 minutes they start to get a little bit monotonous so a little bit too yeah <laughs> there you go that tree there <laughs> so you can see the three of them sitting on top and they are aptly named gray go away bird one because they're gray and two because of the call that they make there we go listen go away <laughs> They're shouting at everyone to go away. I'm sorry, are we disturbing your afternoon? No. Oh, excellent. So we didn't get a response, which is a good thing. Oh, no, we did. So maybe I was just to jump the gun there with deciding whether or not we were disturbing them. I feel like it's more the lions that are disturbing them than us. And eventually they'll get bored of this and fly away. But I don't see any sign of an owl or anything like that. So it must be our carpet of lions that's lying under the gory tree causing it. But it is starting to get much cooler. The temperature is starting to change now. It's actually very pleasant. Now and the sun is starting to dip down towards the horizon. So we're getting to that time of the day that the lions might start getting active. But I can't believe that Jamie is still sitting with her serval. I'm absolutely envious. So let's jump across to her. I never thought I'd say this, but we've actually ended up with a flat cat serval sighting. I don't know if you can spot her. See if you can spot her as we slowly zoom in into the spot that she's hiding in. I wonder how many serval we've driven past. We always talk about that with leopards. 
I imagine the number must be somewhere in the thousands by now. Can you see it? There she is. You can just see, because she's turned her head away from us now, you can just see the backs of those gorgeous ears. Always listening. She hasn't gone asleep. Oh, she hasn't gone asleep. <laughs> That's not what I meant. She hasn't fallen asleep at all. She's resting, but she's still alert and she's still constantly listening. And she gave us close examination and then decided we actually weren't that interesting. Ali, have Serval ever been mistaken for a cheetah? Um, I suppose some at some point in history somebody has mistaken a serval for a cheetah. There's a, there is a huge size difference. They really are much, much smaller than a cheetah. It's a, I suppose you could mistake it for a cheetah cub, but cheetah cubs are very fluffy, so maybe not. Um, I imagine somewhere back in history the proposal was that cheetah and serval were in some way related, which they are. They're part of the cat, the, the um, they're part of the the cat order that they are not closely related at all. Now, I can see where that comes from, though, especially with the, the markings on their bodies. The build, they've got those long legs as well, powerful, powerful back legs, though, of course, their tail's much, much shorter than that of a cheetah. They don't need to use their tails as a rudder in the way that cheetah do as a balancing instrument. And those massive ears are also a giveaway. But yes, I imagine somebody who's uninitiated to wild animals, perhaps unfamiliar, with African animals could easily make that mistake and think it was a cheetah cub. Now she's dozing quite happily. This is a fantastic way to spend an afternoon. Ears still rotating. Sinak, this is the perfect environment for serval. They like to hide in long grass, so she would prefer the longer grassed areas. Obviously, she won't always have that option. As we get further into the dry season, she'll, and as the wildebeest come back into this area, they'll remove most of the grass, and she won't have that option. They like to have hiding places in drainage lines, so essentially river systems or creek systems where there's plenty of dense vegetation for them to hide in. They tend to stalk along there and spend their days there. But they like these open plains and obviously anywhere where there's rodents and birds for them to hunt and there are plenty of escape place, places for them to escape if they need to, whether it's up a tree or into a very dense bush so they can hide away. This particular serval is... Oh, I, I think it's the same one. I would love to actually get hold of screenshots of both today's sighting and the one that we had, that Manu and I had the one evening. I don't know where Taylor had that extraordinary serval sighting with the hyena. That was amazing. But it would be wonderful if it was the same one. Judy, black and white ears, very similar to most of the animals out here. And they, of course, animals tend not to speak to each other. They do, of course, they communicate vocally, but most of their communication is done visually. And having your, the most important features enhanced by coloring like black and white that stands out really clearly is a way of emphasizing what it is they're saying. So those ear twitches, you, you know from your pets at home, if you have cats or if you have dogs, when they have their ears flat behind them, they're not happy at all. Of course, the tail is also a very important part of their visual communication. And I think what you'll probably find is that those ears are also a great way for serval kittens to follow their mothers around as well. When she's trying to lead them through the long grass, the black and the white stands out clearly. And whilst predators, they're not, I mean, there's the old wives' tale that they, they only see in, in shades of grey and black and white. I mean, they do see colour. They do see a little bit of colour. Not as much as we do. But black and white stands out no matter what the season no matter what the environment. So that's why they have, and if you look at the, the backs of lion's ears, they're black. It's all just to enhance visual communication. Bri, Bri you say that they remind you of tiger's ears. 
I well, it's this very similar movement in the way that all cats use utilize their ears and that great range of movement, the ability to rotate their ears right backwards and obviously determine exactly what direction the sound is coming from, which most human beings have lost the ability to do. Some people still have that residual ear twitch. I can't do it. Manu, can you twitch your ears? No, not, not anymore. You could twitch your ears. When he, Manu says when he was younger he could twitch his ears. I can't, but some people can. A residual link back to when we were able to move our ears around. But yes, I know exactly what you're saying. And you'll find with all cats the body language is very similar if you if you have cats at home or if you know cats you can read you can translate a lot of what you've learned from your pets onto wild animals obviously not always completely the same but very very similar in the way that they they use their ears whether it's to listen or whether it's to communicate at the moment she's just resting she's making sure that nothing's sneaking up on her i know there's a there's a leopardess a female leopard that lives around here. I, I haven't seen her, but I found a lot of her kills. And Viam and James saw her one evening. So that would be something that she'd be listening out for. Hyenas, lions, and of course the rustle of a rodent. And I think the fact that she's been as mobile as she has been today has been largely because it's quite cool and cloudy. There are... They're active during the day and at night, so they, they're active at both times of, of the day. They're not strictly nocturnal, but I'm sure you'll find that they're more active on cloudy days. And in fact, the howling wind that we had earlier would probably have helped her as well. She's taking advantage of it. I think it's going to be fascinating to sit with her, so even though she's a little bit sleepy now, we're not going to move an inch, and I imagine that Tristan has very similar ideas back in South Africa. Well, I do, Jamie. I've been watching these lions, and they have their paws in the air, so I thought, well, let me see what it's like to have my legs in the air and to lie back and enjoy the sunshine. I can tell you it's quite comfortable, except that the Land Rover is a little bit squished for me at the moment. It's not quite that comfortable because of the steering wheel. I'm trying to find the best possible way that I can sit to be like the lions, but definitely the paws in the air has got something to it, and I think I shall try it more often. I would imagine it would be better without shoes on, but, well, we can't have no shoes on while we're driving because that will just look ridiculous, but it's quite comfy. I must say, so we'll take a leaf out of the lion's book. Seb, have you tried this before? Yeah, I've got my spot at the back. Yeah. You've got your spot at the back, so Seb's also given it a bash. Of course, it's not great if an elephant came bounding out at us, we would have a bit of a trouble, and I think my back might break if I stay like that. So I'm going to have to do a bit of contortionism work to get my leg back in the car. There we go, that's better. So you can see our lions are still fast asleep, and this is what happens when you watch lions while they're sleeping, is you start thinking of all kinds of random things, particularly like your legs being up in the air and all kinds of other things, but I think it would work. You definitely catch more of a breeze with the legs than them being down in the footwell of a car, that's for sure. So I'd imagine they're on to the right idea, but if shade would also help as opposed to being in the sun. But the pride itself is just flat and sleepy as ever. They obviously had a hot day and it's all about just resting and you can see a lot of them are lying with their back legs open and they do this just to try and help cool themselves down as much as possible. So open that stomach out, get a bit of a breeze over the tummy between the back legs and that all just helps with the cooling nature as well as just to get a bit of airflow through those sections. You can see that female is sporting a new fashion as well. She's got the leaf look is what I like to call it. It's when you don a leaf and I don't know if it's in the thing with lions these days but she's got the leaf on the cheek. Maybe it's something like a piercing in the lion world. Who knows? You can see a little bit of sun hitting there, glinting on the leaf itself. Maybe that's the look she was going for, is waiting for that little patch of sun to hit it to show it off. But it just shows you how sleepy they are for the fact that there's a leaf that's fallen onto her face and she hasn't even wiggled it off. Just gives you an idea of how tired our kitties are at the moment. But they will wake up, they will start to get up shortly, I'm sure. Darlene, you're wondering if these lions here have it more rough than the ones in the Mara? 
Uh, yes and no. I suppose not really. I mean, the Namara Lions have their own challenges. They've got a lot of, of things that they've got to deal with. Remember, the density of lions there is high. So they, from what I can gather, bump into each other every now and then. They've also got a lot of external things. So poaching is a big problem. There's a lot of human-wildlife conflict on the borders of the Mara area. So the lions there have a bit of that to worry about. Um, but in terms of food items, when the migration is there, most definitely the Mara lions have it way easier than what the Sabi Sands lions do. The Sabi Sands lions, especially these in Kuma Pride, you know, they they thrive on buffalo. That's what they want and what they need to get. And we've seen there's very few buffalo this year. For the first time in my entire career, this is the least amount of buffalo that I've ever seen in this section in the last couple of years. So it really is desperate times. And the lions have had to then rely on a lot of smaller things. So they're having to go after impalas and zebras and wildebeest. And they're not really geared for that. They, they're not taught that as cubs and it's foreign to them to be hunting those fleeter footed individuals and that's why they've probably struggled a little bit more than if we had had a lot of buffalo around so this year in particular the Mara lions must have had it much easier over the last few months but then come the summer months and those wildebeest disappear and they go down towards the Serengeti well I'm talking about our summer months so you know December January February March they disappeared to go and carve down in the Serengeti and then you'll find that those lions they also have it tough they're gonna have to try and find food it doesn't come as easily but there seems to be a lot more prey animals that are in the lion spectrum than they are here. Here it seems a lot more in the sort of leopard spectrum of, of antelope species that we get because they can hunt elant, they can hunt buffalo, wildebeest, zebra, giraffe, all kinds of topi. So they've got a lot of different antelope that they can go after and hunt. So I think our Inkahuma pride has had a really tough winter season. It's normally a time of plenty, but this year has been a lot harder. Now talking of lions and the Mara lions, let's jump across to Brent and see how his lions are doing. Well, I'm a long way from where you last saw me and we're with different lions and there's quite an interesting story happening here. This is, looks to me to be the Purungat sub-adults, two young males, two young females, and they are very, very hungry, and there's not an adult lioness in sight. So I wonder what's happened. Of course, there's been quite a bit of turmoil uh, with the Purungat pride recently, with uh, one of the notch boys dying. So has there been a takeover? Have they run to the side of the river to avoid the new marauding males? And uh, they are looking very, very hungry. Shame, guys. But luckily for them, there are some wildebeest and zebra around. Not massive herds, but a couple of thousand. So there's some through there that they were trying to stalk when we found them and they got spotted. Silly kitties. But they are very, very hungry. Uh, hello, Ricky. Ricky says, uh, King of the Safari. Well, thanks, Ricky, I think. <laughs> and uh, I'm hoping that these guys move up towards where we are. There are more wildebeest and zebra behind us. And I'm hoping that that's the direction they're going to head. And we're going to stay out for quite a, quite a bit tonight. We're going to stay out, see if they, they hunt. Uh, I haven't decided whether I'm going to stay with these guys. I'm going to give them about another half an hour, 45 minutes. But if they head further towards the river, as you can see, there's a big lugger there. Uh, we unfortunately uh, are not going to be able to follow them. But for the moment, they're hungry lions and there's wildebeest and zebra around. Now, the area we're in is called Majia Chafu which basically means dirty water is the name of this little lugger. There you can see one, two, where's number four? Three, I see three. Four must be off to the right slightly. And this area has had a lot of rain since I was last year. It is emerald green. Hi, Paul. Uh, Paul's wondering if a, a lioness were to die, uh, would another lioness take care of her cubs or even a male lion? Um, 
the male lion would take care of the pride, not the individual cubs as such. But um, another lioness, depending on the age of the cubs, if they were around three months old, two months old, uh, she would definitely then take care of those cubs. And that is one of the, the, the benefits of being in a in a pride and a social group that they do have the chance to be able to take care of each other. Ooh, the wildebeest coming back towards them. Unfortunately, I don't think they'll be very successful because the grass is non-existent at the moment. It's uh, about half a centimeter high. But the gnus have already spotted those lines. They were snorting at them earlier. Just trying to hear if they'd started snorting again. And very pretty clouds out there this evening as well. Sinak is wondering, do I think there are also zebras and wildebeest? Well, indeed there are. We saw those wildebeest there. There's some zebras behind us. Um, and if we look up to the left, uh, probably about 900 meters away from us, um, up on the, the crest of that little hill, um, there are some bigger herds of wildebeest and zebra and there's some more further to the south of us as well so yes there are wildebeest and zebra around uh, but hunting when you're young and inexperienced and also with this really short grass uh, it could be quite problematic what is that I thought I saw another lion for a second but not so it's, it's gonna be quite interesting to see which way they move if they move down towards the Mara River and down down in that lugger. If, if I was them, I'd say staying a, a close to this little lugger here is their, their best strategy going forward uh, and hoping that these animals come down for a drink. But uh, while we wait it out with these big cats, uh, let's go across to Jamie with her very relaxed serval. Very relaxed. In fact, I think we're all having a rather relaxed afternoon, waiting it out with our various cat sightings. Of course, if she moves now, I'll be in deep trouble because it'll take me a while to actually manage to get my legs back under the steering wheel. She's still here. She's perfectly relaxed. She's lying there. Let me try and. Uh, mine is not going to. Yeah, he is going to go back. So I was going to say, you're not going to let me do this gracefully. There we go. All right. Back comfortable once again. As much as I wanted to make that look comfortable, it really wasn't. No, we're all having, all three of us, between South Africa and the Mara, are having a highly successful afternoon. And I think all of us waiting it out to see what the fall of night brings. I imagine she's going to get moving in the next half an hour or so. We, of course, will have to do the camera swap. That occurs at around about the sunset time, where Manu will have to de-rig everything and rig up the ME20. But that, of course, will give us those extra few minutes of colour before we switch to infrared. Ah, Julia, no, I have not. I have not seen a melanistic serval. However, I am in the land of the melanistic serval, aren't I? And apparently they're seen quite regularly towards the Abadares, which is where we were actually thinking about going when we were on leave, and then it didn't quite work out that way. But would I give my left eye tooth? Oh, it could kind of be a close thing. I would really love to see a melanistic serval. Completely, completely black in color. I've only ever seen pictures of them. I've... I, I know they're more common in this area, yeah, or at least in Kenya and Tanzania. So that's something that I would really love to see. I haven't seen one before. There's some truly extraordinary pictures taken somewhere in Kenya. I'm not entirely sure where. I should actually have double-checked where those pictures were taken. But there's pictures of a, a normal colored serval, like the girl that we're looking at now, and a melanistic serval interacting. And it's quite extraordinary. I imagine that my heart would be pounding after a sighting like that. I would be beyond thrilled to experience a moment as rare and magical as that. So no, no melanistic serval for me, but perhaps one day, and perhaps you'll all be there to share it with me. I tell you what, I'll make you a promise. If I, if I ever see a melanistic serval on my travels, um, and if I have phone signal, I'll do a Facebook Live with it. How does that sound? 
me with my completely... I mean, I really am completely useless with social media. But I'll do that. Oh, big yawn. There we go. Starting to see the signs of movement. Similar to lions, similar to leopards, cheetah, all of our big cats. And they start to yawn and lick their feet. There's a chance they're going to get up. Every now and again they go back straight back to sleep just to prove us wrong. But there's definitely a correlation. See, Nook, I wouldn't want to get scratched by one. I, I don't think that they're... I mean, they have retractable claws. They are cat-like. They're not built in the same way that a lion's or a leopard's claws are, which are really, truly powerful things in their own right. Exceptionally powerful tendons, really strong roots to hold that sheath and that claw in place. And those, of course, using for catching and dragging down their prey. And since serval don't exactly hunt things much larger than a bird or a, or a rodent they don't need to have truly massive claws but they're sure they're very sharp i heard a story once and of a, a caracal that had been caught in somebody's um hello girl somebody's garage and apparently this guy had went in to try and to free her and he put out his foot to stop her attacking him and she took his shoe and his sock off in two swipes she moved so fast I also once had a caracal steal my dinner and I took one look at her as she hissed at me and put her claws out and I decided that I actually was going to let her have the dinner. Her name was Miss Muppet and unfortunately, as I said, it don't, those sorts of stories don't often have a happy ending. She became very, very aggressive. The caracals are slightly stockier, though, than serval. They do have much stronger paws and claws. Similar size, but they're quite a lot more powerful. I still wouldn't want to get scratched by a serval, though. I don't know if any of you have cats that you've ever tried to give a bath when they're reluctant to do so. But I'm sure you felt the effects of needle-like claws. Now oh, she's listening. She's definitely more alert. She gave me a fright earlier. I was watching the sunset and I looked up and I couldn't see her anymore. I thought for one moment I'd completely lost her. But she was just sleeping. Mr. Carly? Yes, I mean, that was what Taylor was, was watching, was a serval, as far as I understand, a serval and a hyena having a standoff. Was it a standoff over a carcass? Yes, I think that a, a serval would scavenge. In fact, we know, we've, we've, we haven't seen it personally happen on Juma, but it did happen with one of Karula's kills, where I think it was Rexon. It was Rexon. Rexon went in and found, followed the drag mark and found the kill and found a serval feeding on it while Karula was away fetching the cubs. That was obviously months ago, but yes, it does happen. They will scavenge off another predator's kill. They're not fussy in that respect. Cheetah generally don't. Uh, they don't want to run that risk, but Serval absolutely will sneak in and take an opportunistic chance at a potential meal. I still cannot believe that there was a Serval hissing at a hyena. That is the most phenomenal behavior. Oh, we're up. Quick scratch. And I think off we go again, I imagine, when she's finished scratching her chin. Is my imagination, or does she look a little bleary-eyed, a little sleepy? All right, as our pretty girl decides uh, to wake up and which way she's going to go, it seems as though it's all action down at Twin Downs. There is action at Twin Dams. There's probably every species under the sun that's at Twin Dams. We've had baboons come flying past us. There has been impalas, kudu. There were some elephants too, but they've moved off. But the real reason we're here is because there is one of our favorite animals in the whole world that's here. And now I'm sure many of you can guess exactly 
who's at Twin Dams because, well, it's the favorite haunt of many of our different characters, but the favorite of them all is, I will show you now, shortly, because he's lying up on the dam wall itself. So we're just going to try and see if we can see. There he is. Now, I'm going to try and find a better position than where I am now without blocking everybody else that's watching so there's some guys that are on the road at the moment so we don't want to block them so i will try and reposition but they're sitting on the wall is little husana by the looks of things it looks like him from this angle i can see his face and he's very sleepy as you can see so lots of different things happening at twin dams husana hasn't poked his head over the dam wall just yet so I would imagine that on the other side when he does poke his dam wall he's going to be I mean poke his head over he's going to be very surprised at just the sheer numbers of animals on that side what's also quite interesting is that he's lying low and I'm sure because maybe he saw the baboons or heard the baboons close by if the baboons see him they will chase him so he's trying to probably keep as low a profile as is possible I'm just trying to see, Seb, let me just try to get forward a little bit for you so that you've got a better view. Because where we are at the moment is not very pleasant. Let's go through here quickly. It's a little bit of a bumpy road. Sorry, Seb. A little bit of a better, Seb. Yeah, you can see there's a car on the dam wall as well so that's tax on top and we luckily got an update from one of the guys in the south that said he crossed over from the south to the north and you can see now he's just taking it very easy hello beautiful boy and he's far less playful than he was yesterday when he was messing around with his scrub hair now he looks very chilled and very relaxed You can see he's sleepy, just much like our lions. It is hot this afternoon, and so that's why you will find that these cats are a little bit on the sleepy side because of the heat. And I'd imagine he'll also wake up at some point soon and start moving around. Our lions were absolutely passed out when we left them, so we decided we'd come down and just see if we can get a better view of Hassan and, and see if he gets up to something this afternoon as well. Look at the size of those paws, they are massive. His front paws are getting bigger by the day. Oh, that's a awesome surprise to have Hosanna back. I thought maybe it might be Tumba because of given where we are and we know that Tumba was seen here a few days ago, so I thought it might be him. But it's really a special surprise and it's completed a really successful afternoon with cats. So let's go back to Jamie with her serval and the sunset. We just have to share something spectacular with you for the moment as our serval starts to contemplate her next move. Oh, good, she's going, she's going to lie down. That should give us the opportunity to switch cameras. However, we just wanted to show you the exquisite sunset that we're enjoying. I mean, I really can't think of a better way to spend an afternoon. I know we say that all the time, but we mean it. The ray is peeking through a hole in the cloud. It's just gorgeous and a serval in front of us Shari yes absolutely I missed the Mara while I was on leave uh, I won't I won't um, I won't lie to you in that one thing I really enjoyed was eating enormous amounts of, of takeaway food not that we're badly fed in the Mara it's just something that you crave when you can't have it uh, yes, I miss the Mara immensely. I also find myself homesick as well for South Africa, for the low fault. I, I wouldn't say I'm longing to return. There's just so much to see and to do here. But yes, I miss the Mara and I missed home as well. But moments like this. Imagine if I'd come back from work a day later, I wouldn't have seen this. Circumstances all working out perfectly. 
as she walks straight underneath the sunset. I have got really exciting news. I think I heard that right. Let's go back across to Tristan, who seems to have had more luck this afternoon. We have, Jamie, we've had not as much luck as you have by the looks of things and by the sounds of it, with you following your serval around all afternoon, which is absolutely ridiculous. I'm still very jealous about that and jealous about Brent seeing Scar as well. It's probably the only animal in the world, as in a individual animal, that I've really wanted to see. All my other favorite animals have been ones that I've seen here in the South Africa, but that's probably one of the individuals that I've really always wanted to see and so a bit envious of the two on that side of the world today, although in saying that, we have had the most ridiculous afternoon. We've had the Batelier drinking, we've had lions, we drove past some Illies just now, there was lots of general game around Twin Dams, and now we've got the little chief as well. So it's just everything has kind of happened for us this afternoon, and from a fairly horrible start to our day with spilling tea and no signal and flat tires and cars not working to, well, royally successful day. We've had two spotted cats, we've had the Nkuma Pride, We've had just everything that we could ask for over the last few days. So it's been a very, very special, special afternoon, actually. So even though we haven't seen Scar or a serval, we've still been spoiled, haven't we, Seb? Very much so. And we've chilled with our feet up like lions. <laughs> so nobody else has done that today, I don't think, especially not on camera. We are the pioneers of that move. Now, Seb, I'm going to move you a little bit because I want... Seb's battling with this car in the background, so I want to... Just Give him his better shot that he can at least not have. Sorry about that, everybody. It seems as though we had an attack of the gremlins and we were about to be in the process of changing our cameras. But due to Tristan's signal disappearing, we've decided to delay that ever so slightly so you get to enjoy a bit more time with that serval. I'm thrilled to hear that Hassan is doing so well. I'm, I miss them. I miss those two little leopards. So she heard something dashed off and then came dashing back onto the road. It's as unpredictable as following leopards when they're moving through the bush. This is what I've learned. She backtracks all the time. Stopping, listening. She's smelling something there. She'll let us get a little bit closer. I reckon I could drive right up to her. I'm not going to because I'd really, you know, she's been so spectacular with us. I don't want her to have any kind of discomfort around the vehicle. But I really think that we could go right up to her and she'd be fine. But this is spectacular. Where are you taking us, little girl? As soon as she stops to look back, then I'll stop and give her a little bit of extra room. And of course, those ears working overtime to listen for the rustles of rodents. dainty feet. I would love to show you her tracks as she pads down the road. Unfortunately, the soil is just that little bit too damp and the light is gone. I think it would be almost impossible for me to do it. She's heard something else, stopping to listen. Nope, not worth it. On she goes. How 
amazing is this? And almost the entire sunset safari spent with a serval. I'm going to be smiling from ear to ear tonight. Ah, Lara Boer, absolutely. This to me is the best kind of catwalk. A very pretty one. Just, no. Not a chance she left a footprint on that soil. And she's heard something else. No, nope. still listening, but not focused yet. I'm keeping a very close eye on her. I want to stop as soon as she shows any sign of not discomfort, but as soon as she shows any sign of wanting to move forward. And ideally in situations like this, it's really better to get yourself into a good place and then stop. I don't particular she's not completely relaxed with us following behind her twitching tail that almost looks like a very skinny leopard walking down the road at first glance a very tiny one there is something model like about her Graceful walk. Oh, well, speaking of, I might have one spotted cat, but it sounds like Brent has found you another. Well, here we go. We have, it looks to be a female. She is gorgeous. This is the Magia Chafu female, and she's looking hungry as well. And there are some wildebeest and, and zebra around, but there should be some impala and Thompson's gazelle, hopefully, up ahead. So we're just waiting for her to come out of that rocky section. Hopefully she's going to move back up towards us. But isn't she gorgeous? I know a lot of people have been asking for Mara leopards. So there we go. Very attentive. Now I know she had a young male cub, and I, as I said, it could be, it could be the young cub, and the young male. Um, and it's a bit far for us to tell at the moment. Mm, looks fe yeah, female. Oh, she's walking the right way. She's walking the right way. We wanted to keep walking up out of the, that rocky section and away from the river. Just gone behind the gardenia tree. But isn't this exciting? So I've only spent one night out hunting with leopards, so quite fun. I hopefully she comes keeps coming. And uh hopefully she comes up this way. And then she's disappeared. There she comes. Um Andrea's wondering how do we identify the different leopards? Well, Andrea, I know that there's a resident female that's seen quite frequently by the guides in this area. You can see she's got a little bit of a limp, and she is quite not starving, but she could definitely eat. Um, and uh, so I know she's seen quite regularly in this area. So that's why I know who this female is. In other areas, it is very difficult in the Mara. Um, there are some well-known females, but in the triangle, not too many. Oh, sneeze. Isn't that gorgeous? Now, what I hope she's going to do, which she looks like she's going to do, she's heading actually up towards the ranger's post. You can see there's some thicker grass uh, in between, and uh, she's going to move up now. I'm sorry, there's a vehicle coming past, and while well, we're going to go get into a better spot. Well, it seems like Tristan is copying me, so let's go see what spotted cat he's got. No, Brent. Um, fortunately, it's the other way around because you're about 400 to zero at the moment behind. And I think we had a sign on screen before you did. So it's more a case of you copying us. But either way, it doesn't really matter to have a leopard in the Mara and the leopard in the Sabi Sands is irrelevant where they are. It's just awesome to have it. It's the best thing ever that we have a day where we've had lions on both sides of the world, leopard on both sides of the world, and then just to throw in a bit of extra, let's just chuck a serval in there as well. It really has been a cat crazy afternoon. So really cool to see. And either way, like I say, it's special that we've got spotted cats on all sides of 
our feeds at the moment and I believe a lot of you are excited to see the little prince well after yesterday's performance where he was jumping up and down like a little hooligan with his scrub hair he really does look absolutely magnificent today and he's I'm surprised he's moved as far as he has given that it's quite warm he's come a long way Chitra Dam is not exactly close and who knows which way he walked to get to this point but either way I'm not complaining it's just wonderful to have him and hopefully he's going to move further northwards into Juma tomorrow morning I am doing a bushwalk so I'm going to try and see if I can come track him down on foot I think that's going to be my plan tomorrow morning because we don't have too many flowers and things just yet so it'll be really cool to track him down also there's a few Ellie's around unfortunately they've disappeared away from the water so we can't see them anymore but maybe tomorrow morning we'll try and get them as well so it promises to be an exciting morning of walking as well as the fact well that we've got an exciting afternoon ahead of us unfortunately our lines have been left behind because I I'm a self-admitted leopard addict and I can't help it it's when there is a leopard around it just makes my day every time and I also find it's really nice to have a bit of sort of difference you know we've got so many lions in the Mara these days and as much as the Inkuhuma Pride is great except when they you know they're sleeping and it's hot it's always nice to have a bit of a difference in amongst all the feeds and to try and sort of go from the serval to the lions and then to a leopard here in the Sabi Sands it just creates such a nice diversity and just goes shows you how well they're working hand in hand at the moment i remember drives when i first started safari live where we would go for days without a cat and now i don't i can't actually remember the last drive we've had where there wasn't a cat seen on drive at all between the two sort of properties so we really are spoiled these days we get to see the most amazing stuff and we get so many great sightings that it's just absolutely wonderful and when you've got a little prince like this that's sitting so close oh look at the yawn which I think means that he might roll over. Edward, you're wondering how long re leopards rest for? It depends, Edward. It's, it's not always a constant amount. Look how his ears are flattening. So he's just trying to keep a low profile because there, are, there were some impalas around that shouted at him a bit. Um, but Edward, it depends. They, they, some days they'll rest a lot more than others. Um, I find that leopards are not more as sort of restful as what the lions are. The lions tend to rest a lot more. Look at how he's creeping. Oh, don't go back that way, no. He must come this side. Okay, he's going to come our way. He's just trying to keep a low profile, but look how beautiful that is. Osana, you are as beautiful as you get. Look, he's crawling along right towards the car. He's coming right past us. Hello, beautiful boy. How are you? You can see he's just giving a little look to Seb. Hello. A little sniff of the back tire. There we go. Just making friends with Sebastian on the back. That's about as close as you're ever going to get to a wild leopard. Isn't that ridiculous? You just see his little face peeking out behind the car there. Where are you off to, you silly cat? But now you see how he uses the dam wall to creep along so that things don't shout at him and then once he's down on the other side, he can then sort of go and he's, I'm sure, going to have a drink. So let's quickly jump across and see if we can't get onto the other side there where we can see him drinking. He's got to get past tax at this stage because he's going to go down. It's going to be a little bit of distance visual of him drinking, but it will still be really, really nice as we do. Now, he's probably going to get disturbed at some point by those that must not be mentioned. So if you do see us going off him, it's not because we want to. It's just, unfortunately, he's got some company. Sorry, Seb, I'll be in position in two But it's going to be really nice from this side. It's quite far, but it will be so beautiful because we're going to be directly opposite him, which will be nice. There we go. Just got to get through that little gap and down. And there we go, Seb. How's that? Straight across.
Welcome, welcome to the Mara. And we've had lions, we've had cheetahs on the hunt, but very seldom do we have a leopard on the hunt. And where she, she's just snuck off here. I'm not sure what she saw. I can't see it. And I can't see her now. <laughs> she should be popping up shortly. I just want to go up ahead here. I just want to make sure there's no gazelle or impala. It could be something small like a dick dick as well. But she suddenly started jogging off and she is an absolutely gorgeous female leopard. This is that she's moving away from the open areas towards these slightly thicker areas. Can you see her, Craig? Now, leopard stalks can often take quite a long time. She might go fast. Oh, no, okay, I've got her. Um, to just to the left of that little green bush. Let me go forward for you a bit. So that really dark green bush. Oh, there we go. There we go. So in in that dark green bush, there's a little window. Um, you got her. Let me just keep, keep, keep. Just go to the left slightly. Sorry, to the right. Now, this is, this is why a leopard, there she is. Okay, so there she's moving. Okay, there we go. Now, her, that's how good her camouflage is. Look at that. She is absolutely melted into the, into the trees. Now, dictics and hares will, will lie up in little thickets like this. So she might have spotted something that we didn't see. Her eyes are perfectly designed to pick up movement. Now you will hear some other vehicles around us, but very soon, as it gets dark, we're going to be the only car out here in the Mara. You can just make out her rosette through that. There, you see her head moving. I wonder what she's seen. Now this area has got quite a lot of Grant's Gazelle, Impala, Thompson's Gazelle. All ideal prey sizes for a female leopard. I'm just having a quick scan around us. Let's see if I can see what she's possibly interested in. I'm going to try and move shortly to see if we can get a better view of her. Now, when we saw her, before she dashed off into the open, um, she was quite hungry, so her belly was concave. So I'm definitely going to stick with her for <coughs> the foreseeable future. I just want to have a quick look up here so we can see what might be coming up ahead. Now, of course, she might not have heard something. She might have seen, I'm oh, sorry, seen something. She might have heard something that has caused her to move on. Hi, Christy. Christy wants to know how long will a leopard stalk its prey. The longest stalk I've ever seen was about three and a half hours, but I'm sure sometimes um, they can go for even longer than that. And sometimes what they'll do is they'll just sort of wait around the edge of a uh, herd of impala or, or, or anything like that uh, till it gets dark uh, before they start stalking. So they keep an eye on their prey, uh, but not actively sort of hunting it. Okay, let's have a quick look. Oh, we've got a little bit of a There she is. Oh, no, she's decided to lie down. 
You got her through the window there. I think she must have seen something small like a dick dick, and she raced into the thickets after it, and I think it's made good its escape already. There she is. Now we can see her nice and clearly. Isn't she gorgeous? Remember, this is 100% live coming to you from the Maasai Mara in Kenya. Now, when she puts her tail up like that, um, and you can see the white quite clearly, it's uh, often a sign that she has been spotted uh, by whatever she might have been hunting. So with big cats, this often happens. They'll go off on the stalk and, and on the hunt, and uh, very quickly, if they get spotted, or if they fail, they'll lie down, they'll rest. They could rest for five minutes, they could rest for three hours. You never know. And that's why, when following big cats out live in the wild, you have to have lots and lots of patience. I'm just going to see if we can get a slightly closer look at her. So, we're going to be staying out here for the next couple of hours. I'm really sure she is going to hunt. I think we might get a good view through this little window. Oh no, oh dear. Let's try from a bit further back again. She disappeared. She's moving, she's moving, so she could be on the hunt again. So that's why you never know what's going to happen. That's the joy of being live in the African bush felt. So it looks like she changed direction. There she is. Oh, we're going to have such a good view. This is going to be absolutely gorgeous. Hello, pretty lady. Now, she's looking up towards the west of us. Now, there's a little gully there. There could easily be some impala. Oh, she is very, very pretty. Isn't that wonderful? Now, one of the ways we identify individual leopards is by their spot pattern, which is the two spots. Oh, see, she's heard something. She's definitely heard something. There's something very much keeping her attention. Oh, and as it's getting darker, the frogs are starting to call. Okay, well, we're going to stay with this female leopard. I'm pretty sure she's going to hunt. I think she's going to head further to the west. So while we do that, let's head back to South Africa and Tristan. Brent Leo Smith. There's definitely something about him. He's a character. You can't say anything else. But he is a character for sure and a highly entertaining one at that.
But uh, how cool is that? A leopard female in the Masai Mara stalking. I'm so happy for Brent because I give him trouble about it and the fact that we've been seeing more leopards. But it's a lot easier to find leopards here given that we can track and we have a very good density in this area as you can see by us looking at Hosanna. We've had leopards all week. It's been really quite fantastic. And so I'm super glad that he's managed to get one on camera and he's going to be able to spend some time with her because that's just an excellent way to spend a day and I'm sure up there I would love to know if they differ and how they move around in that particular section and if the way that they move is different to our leopards here but it looks like Hosanna is going to head back towards Little Gari because he's had a drink and now he's heading back up onto the dam wall you can see look how he's getting into a low posture as he goes up the dam wall just checking around making sure that those impalas that shouted at him earlier have gone and just surveying the landscape watching a water thickney that was shouting at him as well just checking that as he goes over that he doesn't surprise anything on the other side so you see low body profile keep those ears down keep that head down as much as possible and then just check slightly over the top of the dam wall make sure you're not going to spook anybody so let's reposition ourselves quickly so that we can get a really nice view of him from where we are I'm just going to be careful because there's a really big ditch here that I don't... Oh, sorry, Hosanna, did I give you a fright? Sorry, boy. He <laughs> got a fright of the tree crashing down. So there was Impala's alarm calling, and I think he maybe thinks there was another leopard here, and that's maybe why he got a bit of a fright. But look how regal he looks up there at the moment. He looks just like a big male leopard should look. That is about as beautiful as it gets when it comes to looking at a leopard, that's for sure. I said, let me just reposition you slightly, although that's perfect, actually. And Nisa, you say you agree? Absolutely beautiful. Well, it is, isn't it? I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. If you're thinking of a leopard, that is about what you would think of in terms of a perfect pose. Well, for me, anyway, I think that's absolutely wonderful up on the dam wall watching what's going on he's just checking and making sure that he can see anything that might come and drink so he's got a perfect vantage point from up there it is really the best place for a leopard to be as far as I'm concerned anyway I wonder what he's watching. He seems to be watching something behind us. But like I was saying, the Impalas were going crazy earlier and they weren't actually looking directly at him. I don't know if maybe his scent was blowing in their direction or if there was some other reason. But he's been a lot more nervous since that period. He's been trying a lot more to kind of watch what's going on. He's been a lot more kind of hesitant in his movements. So wouldn't it be amazing if Tumba arrived as well for a drink? That certainly would put the proverbial cat amongst the pigeons. It would be really quite wonderful if we did see little Tumba in this area as well. Ali, you're asking about all the leopards and whether or not they have names. Well, Ali, most of them do, and it's more ID kits than names, so they get given names just on their character and things like that because it'll get confusing after a while if you just have numbers. But they do, so all the leopards that we know of. If it's a new leopard that's coming to this area and we don't know them, then it's a little bit different and we'll battle a little bit, but most of them do have names for sure. Seb, I want to just go and reposition you so that we don't have that branch on the left-hand side because that's going to make it that much better. I just need to get around this tree on the other side because we're going to get rid of that horrible branch that's sitting in front of his whole body and then we can hopefully get the whole body perfectly on the camera which is going to be absolutely wonderful. It's just going to have to get around a little bush here quickly. And the best that we're going to be below Hosanna, below Hosanna which is wonderful too because looks down on you it really is a sort of very different perspective to have so we're going to be here Seb just tell me when you've got a nice clear gap there how's that oh sorry hooter we don't want to set the I didn't mean to hoot at you oh he's watching a nyala that's what he's watching there's a nyala on the other side of twin dams that's slowly but surely approaching this general vicinity and that's what he's watching but look at that isn't that beautiful his stare is absolutely magnificent from here and 
Nancy, you say he's very pensive. He is a bit pensive, isn't he? He's watching very carefully as to what's going on and making sure that he's taking in the surroundings that are here and making sure that he's checking on all of these available animals to hunt because at the end of the day, if a Nyala comes and he can hunt it, we know that he was hunting scrub hares this time yesterday, so he's going to take any opportunity he can get to get any food source. So it's a clever place for him to have positioned himself. It's definitely a far better place than being away from water at this stage. But I've found that his expressions are starting to get a lot more serious at the, these days. He no longer has that sort of cub look to him anymore. He seems to get a lot more of a serious face. And look at that. Look how his ears are focused, his eyes. He's watching that Nyala as best that he can. There we go. Look at the ears perking up. So you find that his ears will twitch and move accordingly as to what's going on. So he's gonna, sometimes it's gonna turn backwards if he hears something behind him, or it will be forwards. Just depends on how he hears things. But this, how's that? To, to be lower than him and just have him at eye level is such a different perspective. It's not a perspective you're gonna see every day. You know, often they're on termite mounds, but he's on this flat road. It's just that much better in terms of seeing him. It's always, I know a lot of photographers always try and get into positions like this where they can be a lot lower than their subject because it always looks better when you shoot up to them. It makes them look a lot more impressive. And like I say, Hosanna is looking a lot more big male leopard by sitting the way he is currently than he was a few months ago. But that is beautiful. And there's a bit of color in the sky. The only thing that's ruining where he's sitting at the moment is the telephone wire that's behind his head which you can't see because the camera is higher than where I am oh are you going to lie down now look at the size of the paws how cool is this <laughs> this is as good as it gets in terms of a leopard sighting that's for sure we're being absolutely spoilt by Hosanna he's posing in the most perfect place for us. He's going to probably have a nap now, but there's so much happening around Twin Dams and so many different animals that have come down to drink, and I'm sure more will come, that it will wake him up at some point. Joe, you say even though he's growing up, he will always be our little Hosanna. Well, exactly. He might start looking like a big male, but he definitely still is our little Hosanna and will always be that way, and it's it's just nice to see that he is growing up and that he's been so successful. And you can see there's the colors I was talking about. Is that not a beautiful view of a leopard under those pinks and blues and oranges? A little bit of wispy cloud there as well. Really is very, very pretty indeed. Spoilt is what we are. To be able to sit in Africa and listen to the hardy dars fly over and have a leopard lying five meters from us. It's just a very special way to spend an afternoon, that's for sure. But he's not nearly as active as what the leopard in the Mara is at this stage. It seems the Mara le animals tend to hunt a lot more during the day than what ours do. Ours tend to be a lot more nocturnal, kind of outside, well, over, past sunset and, and before sunrise, whereas the cats that side seem to hunt most afternoons. It's quite an interesting difference between here and there. Now, we're going to sit with Hosanna as he just sits underneath the beautiful sky of southern Africa and he has his little nap because I'm sure it won't be long lived. And so while we do that, let's go back to Jamie and her hunting serval. From Hosanna with spots to our pretty little serval. We're still here and we're still with her. We've completed the camera swap, which is why, even though I actually can't even see her anymore, we are able to get these amazing views in color. Now, because there's very little ambient light tonight, because it is cloudy, we will have to switch to infrared, I would say, before the night is over. But for now, we can take advantage with the ME20 of every little available bit of ambient light. 
So she's here. She's heard something. It's been fascinating. It's a bit difficult to sort of juggle following her and swapping the cameras around. But while we've been doing it, I've been watching her behavior. And she's moved from croton thicket to termite mound to bush to bush to bush and listening, stopping sniffing and listening each and every time she gets there. Obviously looking for things like scrub hairs, rodents that would be hiding away during the day and coming out at night. And what she's focused on, or she was focused on, and I think it's, she's playing a long game here, there's something rustling in the bushes to her right. And I think she's waiting to ambush whatever it happens to be. She crept forward so silently. And then she's sitting down in that typical cat pose. And I remember distinctly when Viam and myself were with a, an African wild cat. We sat for two and a half hours watching her. And she was stalking at the beginning of those two and a half hours. And it was only right at the end that it actually launched itself forward and caught a bird. We, of course, missed it. <laughs> no, we didn't. We haven't got it on camera, but it was... We really thought she'd gone to sleep. Her movement surprised us all. I think something similar will happen with this serval. Now she's just spots. Manu has become my eyes, for now. He's going to help me keep an eye on her. I have got my spotlight, but obviously, while she's hunting, we're going to keep its use to an absolute minimum. Our beard, you say that the low-light camera is working so well. It is, isn't it? We're very fortunate to have had access to the technology that we've been using. From the thermal imaging to the low-light camera, it's provided us with an insight that we would never have had otherwise. An opportunity to actually follow them without either having to leave them because we run the risk of disturbing them or actually disturbing them with the spotlight. We still use it when it's appropriate to do so. But I mean, this is, it's pitch black, not quite. That's an exaggeration. It's at the point where I can't, I can barely see. I can barely make out the bushes in front of me, let alone the serval. Very hard to convey just how spectacular it is. And she's just a puddle of spots in the long grass. Ricky, absolutely. Such patience indeed. For her, it'll mean the difference between a success and a failure. And for us, actually, I mean, you absolutely cannot be out here and expect to see spectacular things right off the bat. Spending time with these animals requires a huge amount of patience. And when it pays off, it does so spectacularly. Those ears stick out so clearly. We were talking about it earlier. She's really treated us to the most spectacular afternoon. Lions, leopards, serval. Oh, something's caught her attention. Tony, you say serval babies would be a great sight to see, and perhaps this is wishful thinking. It's not. I'm thinking the same thing. This is a female. I think it's the same one we've seen regularly. She's relaxed around vehicles. There have been serval kitten sightings in the Mara before. It's just, it is definitely in the realms of possibility. <laughs> <laughs> I think, sorry, I didn't quite catch your name. I think it was Louis. <laughs> you wanted to know if the, the serval kittens would be called serv servalettes. <laughs> oh, there she goes. Trotting forward. Let's just wait to see. Oh, she's going to go hide behind that bush. Which way is she looking? Let's go. Oh, oh. Her attention is over there. Do a quick reposition. Left or right, left or right. Left, says Manu. Manu acting as my ears and eyes. No, just my eyes. My ears work fine in the dark. There she is. 
she is. Thompson's. Look at the Tommy's go. I thought I saw a brief flash of white. <laughs> I want to see a serval kitten now. Like I haven't been spoiled enough. Well, you never know. Manu and I seem to have some spectacular serval luck going recently. Might just pay off. Phoebe, you want to know why they have such long necks? I, I think it's just part of their general design, which is quite long and lanky. Um, I'm not sure that there's a specific purpose. Obviously, the longer the neck um, and the longer the face, the less powerful the jaw becomes. You need a sort of a stout, compact face to have really powerful attachment points for, for jaw muscles in, in, in terms of cat and dog design. I would perhaps suggest she doesn't need to have massive crushing power in her jaws. Did I see something go past her there? No, I think it was my imagination. Oh, look, she's doing that little back twitch thing that all cats do when something's just a little bit itchy. Bree as we spoke about, they're not, they are powerful enough, but they're not built as stocky, powerful killers. So I would say that the largest prey that you'd be looking at is probably something like a scrub hare, potentially, or something along the lines of a Franklin, maybe even a guinea fowl, if she was able to hunt them in the trees at night, which is relatively large, actually, when you compare it to her body size but I think it would probably stop around about there. I don't know if there's any recorded cases of serval killing small antelope. I doubt it. There we go. I'm going to switch across to infrared. And just so that we can see her slightly clearly, or more clearly. It is very, very dark now, so this is going to be our best way of keeping track of her. I've never followed a serval at night before. Well, at least not for very long without be losing it. So this is going to be a first for all of us. Hmm. Beautiful. There's something genet-like about their faces. I don't know if anybody else agrees with me. I think it's the length of the nose. Andy, that's brilliant. The Audrey Hepburn of the cat world. Absolutely. Those doe eyes of hers. I couldn't agree more. So there we go. Takes us back to a conversation we had weeks ago about which actor or actress would voice various animals. There you go, Audrey Hepburn would be the serval. Alright, well, while our serval waits for her breakfast in the Mara, not quite at Tiffany's, let's go back to South Africa to see what the cats are up to there. Well, Hosanna is sleeping, but it does sound like there's another leopard on its way here because there's alarm calls behind me. And it sounds like she... Ah, they've just found her now. So it sounds like a female leopard around the Mulawati, which is amazing. So it sounds like Tandi, not too far from where we are. So maybe what we'll do is if Hosanna is going to sleep... I just want to listen. I wonder if he's coming south. Let me find out quickly on the radio if he's coming south, or she's coming out south, should I say. Uh, Ralph, is that leopard mobile south? 
Oh, he's not answering me. They're too busy talking on the radio. But there's definitely another leopard just north of us at the moment. So I wonder if it is heading this side. It would be amazing if it did. But look how beautiful that white tummy is. And the Nyal has also come quite close, but Hosanna hasn't seen it yet. He's still so fast asleep on his damn wall that he hasn't actually seen what's going on. But I'm hoping that this leopard, that one north of us comes here because it'll be interesting just to see the way he reacts to that. But look at that beautiful sky. It is absolutely beautiful. Now it sounds like that leopard is mobile south. Perfect. So we're going to sit here and wait. She is mobile in this direction. She's still quite a way away. She's about 200 meters north of me. So is coming this side slowly but surely, which is fantastic. So we're just going to be patient and wait. And hopefully this leopard will come this side. Although the guy wants to leave that leopard. So I wouldn't mind getting to it before he does. Because otherwise we're going to lose that one. And I would hope that it will come generally this direction. He's saying young female, so it can't be Tandi. Wonder if it's not Shongile. Wouldn't that be a sight for sore eyes if little Shongile joins up with Hosanna again? Well, the last time we saw Shongile was with Hosanna, so it sounds promising. I'm just keeping an eye out north of me. It's still quite far. It's close to where we had Tumba with those elephants for a while, so the Mumba Junction, which they've got to cross a little drainage before they come down to Twin Dams. But given the heat that we've had today, I would imagine that this leopard will come to this area just for a drink of water. Much like what Hosanna has done, so this leopard will head in this general vicinity as well. But come on, Hosanna, wake up. He's still fast asleep, though. He's not interested in anything, and I'm surprised because the alarm calls of that other, of those Nyala and the various other individual animals that we were alarm calling that he didn't even lift his head and it's not far from us like I say it's it's close enough that he should have heard it and should have woken up and you can see a car has just come past us and he is not woken up at all interesting still fast asleep though but it's good news there's another car that's going to join that female so I'm just gonna listen and if they st if they start veering off from coming towards twin dams we'll go to her but either way, we will see this other leopard. I mean, how is this? This is just ridiculous to have another leopard, three leopards in a drive, so two here in the Sabi Sands and one in the Mara. It's just absolutely phenomenal. And the fact that we will have seen a third leopard for the day is really quite special. So we're just being absolutely spoiled. And like I say, sitting where we are right now with this sky that we've got, look at these beautiful oranges. That's my view right now. On my left is a leopard. On my right is that sunset over Twin Dams. There's an Nyala bull, alarm calls, and then to the north of me, which is in that direction, there is also another leopard approaching. So how is that for a special way to spend a day? There you can see the Nyala bull just sitting at the edge of the water, you see his reflection. It's actually easier to see his reflection than it is to see him on that pink, pink water. Beautiful, isn't it? My boy, you're going to have a tough time. You're about to get sandwiched between two leopards, which is not a place you would want to be. See how aware it is as it comes down to drink. It's interesting how slowly it walks. It doesn't want to make too much noise. Or someone wants to check and make sure. And it hasn't seen Hosanna because Hosanna's head is down. He's flat. Difficult to see him in this light. It's that twilight time. And so not easy at all. So that Nyala is trying to slowly make its way to the water. And just make sure that there isn't something lurking. It would have heard the Impala's alarm calling earlier. There it comes. But it is a big Nyala bull. So a female leopard and even Hosanna that's a, probably a bit much for them to take on somebody like uh, Tingana could tackle a Nyala bull like this but it would be a really big kill for somebody like Hosanna look at that reflection in the pink as well so sorry Megan if you can just repeat that you this game drive radio and yourself I just heard Angeline Ah, Angeline, you say how much you love the reflection. It is beautiful, isn't it? Look at that. that especially the hairiness of Anyala as it walks along. That is just so wonderful. And all the hatches of the insects. You can see little mayflies and various other aquatic insects hatching off and causing those little ripples. And then the beard of the Nyala and the horns. What a wonderful picture that is. And then the pink of that sunset. Absolutely beautiful. Spoilt. 
is what we are. Africa at its absolute worst this afternoon. No, I'm just kidding. It's, I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous how beautiful that situation is in this scenario. You can see a night jar drinking as well in the water at the bottom of the screen. There's a couple bats that are also flying around. You might see them zipping through the lightness of the sky. There they go. There went one. Just quickly going past. So we've got bats, we've got nyala, we've got leopards, we've got night jars, we've got a beautiful sunset and just, well, what an absolute treat this is. And we've been seriously, seriously, seriously spoiled today. I know I say it a lot, but it's true. It's hard not to feel really kind of in awe of moments like this when we get to spend time with animals in the way that we have and, and to sit here now with Hosanna completely on our own that sunset is just what a wonderful way to spend a day it doesn't feel like work when we sit and do things like this that's for sure and it really is the best best way to to spend a day and as Megan says what a time to be alive yes Megan you are incredibly correct it is an amazing time to be alive I'm just keeping an eye over my shoulder I'm waiting for the lights of that other vehicle to start coming and it's gonna be a while still I think probably about 10 minutes until it gets here which is gonna cut it quite fine so in the next five minutes if I don't see lights coming my way then I'm gonna go try and catch up with that leopard so we can get a last minute look at whoever it is I still haven't got an ID over the radio as to what leopard it is but it's gonna be touch and go it's it's a route Tundi walks a lot but I'm just somehow hoping that it is Shongile, so we'll have to just wait and see and hope that it is little Shongalolo that is making her way this side to join her brother, who is at the stage a carpet. So, I think what I'm going to do is probably leave Hosanna where he is right now. I'm going to probably start heading towards that female and then follow her this direction and while I do that I believe Jamie is still in the Mara still with her serval which is just ridiculous and I hope she's having a wonderful time on that side of the world. Our serval is on the move once again stalking through the long grass. It's interesting, she hasn't covered much in terms of distance. It's not like following a lion or a leopard when they're really on a mission. She just crisscrosses backwards and forwards over a, in a very small area. Oh, 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 there she go. Oh, what did she get? What was that? A moth. She caught, I think she caught a moth. It was, it was some kind of flying insect. I wonder how much of their diet is insect based. I imagine quite a fair percentage. That was impressive. I barely even saw that. And those huge ears are probably hearing the sound of the wing beats as well as seeing it. She really is the epitome of grace. Standing tall peering through the grass. A scrub hair would be first prize, I imagine. Or a large bird, something like a Franklin or a guinea fowl. She's trotting forward again. Oh, where's she going? <laughs> she's catching, she's catching moths. Or flying ants, I can't actually quite see what it is they are. That's fun. Let's use the spotlight quickly, just so that I can see where she is. And since I know she's hunting insects, my goodness, I'm going to get powerful shoulders with this thing. I'm going to look like Scott by the end of it. Plus, I feel like I'm lighting up Tanzania. Christy, yes, servals are very likely to hunt in the evening. There we go, let me stop here. I can't find the switch on this light. They are both diurnal and nocturnal. They're active during both times. I think that you'll find that their success rate at night is probably much, much higher just because they've got the advantage of darkness. Much like leopards and lions. I mean, we've already seen her make one kill during the day and potentially one kill at night. <laughs> oh, actually, she's just killed twice. 
No flying insect is safe. There you go. Our Lara Moore, her long neck does help her to see above the grass. So we go back to the question of why she has such a long neck. I guess there you go, so that she can peer over the top of the grass. And for those of you that haven't been watching since the beginning, this grass really has, it, it, it is completely different. It was so long in the beginning. Oh, where's she gone? There she is. I feel like I'm holding an old fashioned lantern. James can never mock my spotlighting technique again. The reason I'm using the spotlight now is because I don't want to drive too close to her. It's very difficult for me to gauge distance with the camera, so I don't want to get into her space. What she found there. This is fascinating to watch. This really is the most unparalleled opportunity. Woman, woman, absolutely, now she needs a real meal. That mouse really only filled a gap, I would say, that rodent. Now oh, she needs something serious. Or perhaps another four or five rodents. I mean, I saw some zebra earlier, but I think that might be a little bit beyond her capabilities. Thank you, Manu helping me keep track of where she is and what she's doing. Oh, was that her there? No! No! Ah, I found her again. Okay, I'm gonna catch up with her. Let's go back to Tristan who is following a leopard. We have, so it's not a female, it's a little tumba that's coming past, my absolute favorite little individual. So there he comes, just walking past us and he's walking straight towards where Hosanna is. He's not far now, he's maybe 200 meters from where Hosanna is. So we're gonna see how this plays out. But there he goes past me and he's being a bit shy because baboons are bar barking at him. So the baboons have seen him and are giving him a little bit of trouble. So I'm just gonna try and reverse and get a better position and you'll notice that all my lights are off is because I was trying to just stop the baboons from seeing him and giving him a hard time and that's why I just turned my lights off because baboons can be quite dangerous to a young leopard and so we don't want to give him too much of a problem but he's still mobile so let's just try and see if I can quickly shift now that he's past the baboons I can put my light on no problem and it's okay there he goes into the road again Tumba, you're looking big, my boy. Now, it's going to be interesting because what's going to happen now is he's going to join, well, walk into Hosanna, and it's going to be interesting to see who's bigger. He's definitely, I don't think, as big as Hosanna. Like, now that I've seen Hosanna a few minutes ago and now Tumba, I don't think he's quite as bulky yet, but interesting how it's going to work out because obviously this is the age-old discussion as to who is bigger at the moment, Tumba or Hosanna. But how's this? The two, I suppose, princes, you could call them. One is Prince from Karula, and the, or Little Chief, and the other one is, well, Prince from Karula's lineage. So the two of them are both here. This is just the most ridiculous thing. And you can see Tumba's walking fast. I think he heard those Impalas alarm calling earlier and has rushed into this area. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave little Tumba here and I'm going to go position myself where Hosanna is and we're going to watch Tumba come past into this area. So there goes Tumba down my right hand side and I want to quickly go and have a look. Now there's a diker between Tumba and Hosanna now so one vehicle is going to follow Tumba 
I'm gonna follow, it's gonna sit back with Hosanna and we're gonna see who goes where and what actually happens. But it should be quite promising for an interesting interaction. I have a funny feeling both are gonna run. So I think Hosanna is gonna run south, Tumba is gonna run north, and we're gonna have that situation. That's what I think anyway. Whether that comes to fruition is anyone's guess at this stage. But I think that's what's gonna happen. I don't think these two are gonna battle with each other or they're going to surprise us and the two of them are gonna to come together. Patty, who do you think Hosanna is going to want to play? Well, his head's up now, which is more than what was happening earlier. Earlier, he was completely down and sleeping. So I reckon I'm not sure if he's going to want to play with Tamba. Maybe if he sees a small diminutive leopard, he might think Shongile or a female and be interested and move towards her but I have a funny feeling when they see each other both of them are going to be a little bit kind of whoopsie what is this and maybe move off so we're back with Hosanna now which is quite nice here we go there we is that okay Seb yeah. perfect so what we're gonna do is we're gonna sit here with the two of them and if we need to extend a little bit we will. We're not going to just leave the two of them, but we definitely will watch what plays out. I can see where Tumba is. He's on my other side here. He's still slowly making his way in this general vicinity. He hasn't quite made it just yet, but he is on his way to this area. So we'll just watch very carefully. Look how he's sniffing the air. How beautiful is that? You are very pretty, old Hosanna. Wow. Ah, oh, Laura Moore, you say, what a photogenic poser. Now, you can see Tumba is actually coming. It's not easy from where Seb is now, but I can just see him coming in the light. And I think Hosanna has seen him now as well. So Hosanna has now definitely picked him up and is watching very carefully as to what's going on. And he's just making sure that he checks what's happening. Interesting because there comes Tumba. You can see him just in the distance, it's silhouette walking. Here comes Osana. Osana's coming down towards Tumba. There we go. Look, so he's heading right in that direction. Now, these two are about to meet. I don't think Tumba has any idea Osana is here. Now, I'm gonna just try and there's Tumba. So, let's see. Hosanna is definitely on his way and watching who this is. He's checking it out. So you can see him. Seb, I'm going to give you a little bit of light. Poor Tumba just wants to come and have a drink. He's so thirsty. And there, look, there goes Hosanna slinking along. Okay, Seb, let's get back there quickly. Because I think what we're going to find is that Tumba is about to get a nasty little surprise. So I'm just trying to reverse without being able to actually see too much. A lot of you are excited. This is absolutely crazy. To see these two leopards together is just ridiculous. So I'm going to quickly try and get to Tumba as fast as I can. Because I don't think Tumba's seen Hosanna yet. So let's quickly get round. Sorry Seb. If I'm bouncing you around from... Sammy Jane, you say, oh my gosh, your nerves. But there, look, you see, Tumba is drinking, Hosanna watching him. So they both haven't seen each other. Well, Hosanna's definitely seen Tumba, but Tumba hasn't seen Hosanna yet, or has he? Because he's in a low cowering position. Look, he has seen Hosanna now. So he's in a low cowering position. Hosanna is stalking towards Tumba. So Tumba's just watching. This is crazy. Where is Tumba? Right here. Yeah, like, I don't have light on him. There. <laughs> you can see he's right in the middle of your frame. <laughs> so you can see Seb's just battling a little bit because the IR. But there's Hosanna and look at this. He's drinking, not at all perturbed. Hosanna in front is now sitting and just watching. He's not worried either. How ridiculous is this? This is absolutely insane. I don't think they either, either of them know what to do with each other. How mad is this, guys? We have been so spoiled with the leopard interaction the last few weeks. Except it's always with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know what it is about you, but you bring on the leopard 
spoilings that we get. But this is absolutely crazy. Angeline, you say your heart is beating so fast right now. Well, I know it is amazing, but there's not aggression from either one yet. And it seems as though they've seen each other, although I don't know about Tumba. He's drinking so much that I don't know if he's actually noticed that Hosanna is so close to where he is. But we are in prime position to see what's going on. This is just amazing. There's Hosanna watching. You see, he's not really sure what to do. I think he knows that this isn't Shongile, it isn't Tandi. So I think he's kind of just checking out to think to himself, well, who is this person that's drinking? And it's quite amazing to see. Sana, what are you going to do? Tim, you say just like old buddies? Well, I don't know so much. I think Hosanna is trying to work out what's going on and trying to see who this actually is, whether it's a female or a young male. Tumba is just playing it cool and just drinking because he's probably so hot and thirsty that he just wants to find some semblance of hydration. And, well, they're at a happy medium for now. I don't know if Hosanna's going to come bounding in and chase him, but for now, it's all pretty static. And there comes Hosanna now. He's coming closer. Look. So he's just drifting in here a little bit. See how he's gone into a bit more of a stalk pose. Now, Tumba's seen him and just carried on drinking. He's not in any way perturbed whatsoever. So he's not getting scared of Hosanna's movements, which I thought he might. It's really weird. I would have thought that Tumba would have been a lot more circumspect. George, you're confused that there's no vocal cords. Well, the thing is, or calls, should I say. Well, the thing is with the George is that both these leopards are young, so they don't want to attract too much attention in case the other one is a lot more big, well, a lot bigger or more dominant. So it's more a situation that they're actually just kind of sizing one another up. So, it's, there we go, look. Tumba's just watching now. So I know what are you going to do? Hosanna's in a sort of more of a crouch pose. Tumba's sitting. No growling. I would have thought there would have been a little bit of chuffing at least. And Tumba's coming closer. Is he sniffing? This is craziness. He's, uh, Hosanna's chuffing. So Hosanna's chuffing. He's not sure. Tumba's being far more bold. Look at this. This is ridiculous. A little growl from Hosanna. Look how close they are. How amazing is this? This is ridiculous. What are you two doing? See, Hosanna's not sure. There comes Tumba closer. Are they going to join together? No, look. There we go. Hosanna's now displaying, saying, no, 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 that's close enough now. You stop there. But there is the two young men of this area. And you can see, even though Tumba is six months younger, there is not too much of a size difference. That's an... Look, wait, he's getting closer. Look, look at this. They are within a meter of each other. How is that? That is crazy. <laughs> no, that is absolutely ridiculous. I don't believe it. I would have thought they would have gotten so much sort of more aggressive with one another. I can't actually believe how close. Listen. Now they're going to sniff each other. No, this is absolutely amazing. This is craziness. I can't actually believe this. There is a little bit of growling going on. You can see they are salivating. Tumba into a more submissive pattern. No, this is ridiculous, guys. We are being, we are witnessing something very, very, very unique. This is not something we're going to see every day and certainly something that is not common at all. Two young male leopards squaring off and this might be the first time that these two have actually squared off like this. This is crazy. This 
this is a madness, madness, madness. I think both of them are a little bit scared to go after each other. But look at look at the aggressiveness of Tumba. So our Lara Moa, you say Hosanna is not pleased, look at that drooling. Well, Tumba's drooling too, so it's not just Hosanna at this stage. Both of them are drooling quite heavily, so there is definitely a lot of drooling taking place, that's for sure. So it's an interesting sighting in that neither one is really being too aggressive, but neither one is being too submissive either. So the drooling is part of the fact that they're not happy with one another. There goes Tumba, he's going to try and sort of get out of there. But wow, this is ridiculous. So, drive would normally be finished now guys, but we are going to extend, we're going to carry on because this is just absolutely phenomenal and not something we're going to witness every single day. So we're going to keep up with them for a while longer and just see what happens. Look at how Tumba's rolling. He's trying to display to Hosanna, um, not a threat, leave me alone, don't fight with me. And this is how he does it. Whereas you can see Hosanna has got the much more brave sort of posture. He's up, he's checking out. Tumba, look, look, now they're both lying down. Both of them are almost in a submissive role now. That's craziness, guys. Look at this. For those of you who thought that even these young males would be playful with one another, you can see is a bit of aggression. But I wonder, once the aggression goes and they kind of see each other for a bit, whether or not they're going to just start resting. Because you can see Osano looks around a little bit, Tumba's looking around, there's Tumba trying to just slink off and around. Sorry, sorry, Seb. There goes Tumba. Tumba's decided I'm out of here. He's not going to carry on. Osano's just watching and just chuffing a little bit. Well done, boys. It's good that you don't fight. You have to stand up for each other, but don't fight with one another. This is just the most insane thing. Scott, you say friends. I don't know if friends is a, what I would call this. They, you can see there's fire in Hosanna's eyes, and so is there in Tumba's. Both of them are not chuffed that they've run into each other, but at the end of the day, they've both done what they needed to do. Both were avoided conflict but Hosanna looks like he might go after Tumba there we go you see he's following sniffing now where Tumba was lying and there goes Hosanna he's following in behind Tumba now I wonder if this is not going to go on all night where they're going to just follow each other around interesting where's Tumba gone see he's going to where Tumba drank I think Tumba's right behind me now we're stuck in the middle of this at the moment I'm going to move quickly, Seb. Is Tumba behind us? Yeah. Um, yeah, he's right here behind us. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got. Okay, so Seb's got them. I was just worried just about the mast. So, here we go, Seb. Thank you. So we just need a bit of light because we actually didn't have our IR on. So I do apologize about the shadows of the mast. So that's Tumba on the right. You can see he's growling and hissing with those big eyes. Alright boys, enough is enough now. Let it go. You see Tumba's trying to just move away slowly. He's trying to back away and Hosanna's pressing home the advantage. This is just ridiculous. Now we had this sighting with Shongila and Tandi the other day. Now to have this is just insane. What is going on in the leopard world? Seb, I'm going to just turn quickly because we've got the shadows and I can't okay. see nicely what's going on while they're just sitting. How close are they? It's fine. Let's turn quickly. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Hosanna will follow him though. Hosanna is going to not stay away from where Tumba is. Now to throw into this is also baboons around as well. I can hear them shouting at these two leopards. So there Tumba is just sitting down watching. You can see Hosanna drooling, salivating, which is very typical of a male leopard or any leopard that's upset and has seen a 
individual come into his territory and there's he's just looking around checking but Tumba hasn't run off Tumba's just moved off slightly and is just watching Hosanna I wonder if these two are not going to be together still tomorrow morning it will be amazing if they are and if this growling and carrying on gets on too long I wouldn't be surprised Tundi arrives and then it will be interesting because Tundi will defend her cub with absolute fierceness she'll t chase Hosanna away and not because she wants to it's just that she wants to defend her cub she doesn't want to let her cub get hurt and so she'll even brave up to a male leopard in that case and even the likes of Tingana if this was the same situation with Tingana she would have come running in if she finds the situation to try and get rid of the threat but it seems as though we've reached a little stalemate now Tumba's no longer growling Hassan is no longer growling so we're in a situation where both leopards seem to be a little bit more chilled with what's going on. They're watching each other but they're a lot more chilled. You can hear that in the background there is the baboon's alarm calling. But this is crazy. Absolutely ridiculous. I'm just checking around. There we no other leopard that's arriving in case I, there was a bit of another one arriving with the baboons shouting because I'm not sure the baboons can see them from here. I wonder if Tundi's not on her way this side as well. But I believe a lot of you are just as I am almost speechless as to what to say. I, like I said we had this crazy interaction with Tundi and Shungile a while ago and now we've got this interaction with these two. I don't really know what to make of all of this. It's just been a crazy few weeks of leopard interaction and it's because it's dry. So the leopards are all coming in and it just shows you the void that a female leopard can, can leave because we've got the void left by Karula which has allowed Tundi to come in and this is why we're getting these two boys fighting with one another. Hosanna, you better hope Tundi doesn't arrive here because she's not going to take kindly to you being around. But we're going to unfortunately stop for now and it's going to finish the show while there's a hiatus in the activity. I will sit here for a little bit longer and just see what happens and just in case anything goes crazy. But I think we'll find a situation where these two are not going to really fight too much. They're going to try and avoid it as much as possible. And so tomorrow morning we'll head straight into this area. I don't know if we're going to do bushwalk if these two are still around because it will be just crazy to come and follow up and see if they're around and if Tundi is joined. But from... Seb and myself and Jamie and Brent in the Mara. It's been an absolutely incredible afternoon. I hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you on the Sunrise Safari.